physical, biological disturbances. Careful with your hermosite. Careful with your tillage. Careful with your overgrazing. Careful with disturbances. Cover the soil all the time. All the time. You never leave that down there. Ever. Even if you have to put an armor of skin of residue, but you do not leave that down there. Grow a living root. If you don't have a living root, you are not capturing sun. If you are not capturing sun, your farm is running on ancient sunlight. Diesel, fertilizer, pesticides, chemical. That's ancient sunlight. Reason you're going broke. Diversity, 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 diversity. Corn and soybean is not diversity. It never will, it will never withstand sustainability. You cannot be generating the land in corn and soybean. I am sorry, it will not work. Integrated animals. Those who are doing no-till and cover crops and integrated animals, their souls are the best in the world. Why? They mimic nature. Nature doesn't till, it's got living roots, it's got diversity, it's got animals in it. Now, do I have to have animal consistent? No. You don't have to. Explain that. Now, these three are towards you. I don't have time to go over those three. These are more critical than these five. I have to leave the government, Brian, so that I can put those three up. That would have never been allowed to be spoken in a public setting. I could have never spoke those five, Matt, because you know why it does with you. The one is adaptive management, holistic planning. This one, understand your context, psychologically, cultural, spiritual context, all of it. When I go to Hawaii, the, the Hawaiians look at the land from a spiritual perspective, the Native Americans. Christians, hundreds of years ago, looked at it from a spiritual perspective. But we want to separate the sciences and theology. You cannot do it. That's why we failed miserably. And the last one. You cannot build ecological integrity unless you have human integrity. What does the word integrity mean? Integrity means wholeness of thought and character. You have to have character to come and take notes. To spend your money to come and learn. To spend your time to get educated. You have to have integrity to withstand the mocking of your neighbors. Because it takes integrity. Why are you having cover crops? Are you an idiot? Have you heard that before? <laughs> I've had ranchers get... I mean, I've had people in Idaho. I had a, a ranch in Idaho when we went to Nokia. He said he would go to a local hardware store and they would uh, verbally abuse him and say, you are destroying the resource. It takes integrity to do the right thing. Now, why are we so ignorant? I'm telling you, Ryan, right? you really want to be ignorant man you met. And why, as Americans, do we get offended when somebody calls you ignorant? It's, I don't know why that's a problem. How many of you have all knowledge? Please raise your hand. <laughs> then you're ignorant. <laughs> Let me give you the case in point. I tell my daughters, it's okay to be ignorant. You can fix ignorance, but you can't fix stupid. <laughs> Ignorance is this. We don't know everything. It's okay. Humility kicks in. What did Brian say? And I really appreciate that. Man. We went in there and he was great. I'm here to learn. That's why he's so successful. I tell daughters, I said, daughters, stupid is when you're so full of pride and so arrogant you think you know everything, then you're stupid. Then it goes to rule number one. You have a spiritual problem. You have, a, you have an emotional issue. Ignorance is this. How not to be ignorant. Hans, I want you guys to write this down. The TED Talk. It is brilliant. It has millions of hits. This man, every, every talk he does, watch it. He is the best, best speaker ever. He and his son wanted to go and say, look, why are people so ignorant about the world? So, what he did... He had three questions to ask an audience. He asked the group from Sweden, USA, the TED group. There was about 500 people in that room listening to him, about 
in the TED Talk. And then he asked the monkeys three questions about the world. The monkeys beat everybody. <laughs> everybody about the world. And why did the monkeys beat us in the Americans, or the Swedes, and even the group? This were the three reasons. Number one, every one of us has a personal bias. We interpret the world from you, you interpret the world from where you grew up. The world doesn't work that way. Every one of you interpret farming, your world, from how you learned it, from your community, from your parent, from your father, and it's not so. Personal bias. Number two. Outdated facts. Dr. Hans and, and uh, both researchers found out that teachers and professors are not keeping up with the new sciences. They keep teaching the same old things over and over and over and over. They're not keeping up. Teaching bad, outdated information. Let me give you an example. Our schools, how many are from European descent? Raise your hand. All of us here are. Is there anybody that's not from European descent? All of us are, okay? So why, is, why am I saying that? Our schools were heavily impacted by Isaac Newton, Look at this is. He developed the mathematical formulation of a mechanicistic worldwide view. Also with Galileo, Bacon, Descartes, all these famous scientists. The concepts of the laws of nature. They focused on quantification. They treated the world like a machine. I never read a PowerPoint. I, that is the worst thing you do in PowerPoint delivery. But I have to this way because I want you to get the deliciousness of our issue. Scientific revolution of the 16th and 17th centuries, which championed the study of matter, brought forth the mechanicistic science of Galileo, Descartes, Newton. Nature was seen as a machine. A, a lot of you look at the soil like a medium, like something of nature, just a machine, something to use. Every one of us grew up that way. Very few did not. Galileo postulated that scientists should restrict themselves, think about it, to studying the measurable, the quantifiable, the properties of material bodies such as shape, number, and movement. Doesn't it sound like our scientists now? If, you, if a farmer comes up to a current scientist right now in agriculture and say, I see these things, well, it didn't happen. If I can't measure it, and I can't quantify it, it's not replicable, it happened in your mind. You know what I feel like telling that researcher, that diminished that producer? They said, you're not even real. I don't see a replica of two or three of you, so you must not exist. What a stupid concept. Science is observing. Other qualitative properties such as color, sound, taste, and smell are merely subjective mental projections and should be excluded from the domain of science and it's a goal of describing nature as a mathematical term. So when you have that juicy steak, it's just a projection in your mind. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have been infiltrated through our universities with that thought process. In biblical times, we're more holistic. Since the 16th, 17th century, we treated nature like a machine, it better be measured. It doesn't work that way. This is an example of this guardian trying to show the anatomy of a duck. He tried to put it as like a little machine. It doesn't work that way. You are unpredictable. You are a dynamic living system. Now, the two terms is reductionism and holism. Please understand, unless you understand your filters, I can't even talk to you. 
Because you, you got to understand you got, you're being infiltrated with the wrong filters. Now, is reductionist all bad? No. We couldn't have a cell phone. We could have never gone to the moon without reductionism. We need it. So what is reductionism versus holism? I'll explain. Ladies and gentlemen, that is a picture of what? Debbie, what is, what is that a picture? Is that a car? Or is that parts of a car? Raise your hand. How many things that's a car? Come on. Get involved. You're not sitting there. It's a car in part. How many say it's parts of a car? Raise your hand. Confidence. How many say it's part? It's parts of a car. This is the way we look at the body. We look at it in pieces. You treat the forest, the little forested area in your place, and you look at your farm in pieces. The farm was taken out of that forest, ladies and gentlemen. It works the same way. It never stopped working. It's part of the planet. So what we've done is, if I jump on that tire, Debbie, will that get me to the store? Will they get me to that awesome restaurant down there at the Vickless England? No. If I jump on the engine grinder, now, what if I did this? That would get into the restaurant. It's the pieces working together in relationship to each other make the whole. So here's what I'm saying. Keep it simple. When you walk on that farm, please understand that everything is connected. So when you go run out there with that tennis machine, please understand you're taking that hole and you're working on the pieces. And you're trashing the pieces. And you don't realize that the pieces are connected together as a whole. Unless you start seeing things as holes, you are lost. Let me give you a good practical example, Tom. My wife has been sick for two years, suffering a chronic disease called Lyme's disease. I took her to many doctors, colon samples, ex colonoscopies, endoscopies, scans, all this, and they could not figure out what was wrong. I had to go to a holistic doctor. See, because when you go to the doctor, what did the general send you to? They send you to the liver doctor, to the brain doctor, to the eye doctor. Some of these doctors forget they're connected. Do you know why agriculture and medical science are sisters? Not only we are sick, but the land is sick because we want to treat the body and the land like a machine. And we want to throw chemicals at it. And it isn't it interesting, it's the same companies that own both all the chemical companies. And it's our fault, too. Because we're ignorant about our body and we're ignorant about the land. No more can we afford it. Now, Look at the land, man. This is the way the land is. I, I'm an insurance employee 32 years. I put 32 years of diaper on the land. Let me show you what I'm saying. That is a till soil, man. What is your name again? Jody. Jody, thank you for coming here, Jody. Jody, these soils are the same soils. This is a till soil with no pores, very little pores. This soil has a lot of pores. Now, which soil do you think in that whole picture of the landscape is actually working? Where is sun being captured? Where is it covered? On the diapers. And most of the land is tilled and bare, not capturing carbon. But what do we cost share? <laughs> the diapers. And we're not building aggregates. We're not feeding biology on the 98% of the landmass. We spend billions of it. And they're getting our water in our food. The third one. Not mine. Fake news. I guess Donald Trump did have one thing, right? He's right on this. This is Dr. Rosalind's work. A lot of the information we get is exaggerated. Why would it be exaggerated, Mark? 
It's good itself. Outdated information, your own personal bias, fake news, and our intuition, which is powerful, that if we've got bad information, we make bad decisions, monkeys beat us. <laughs> That's why we're at where we're at, folks. We have an upside down view of the world. Now we're going to have a correct view of your farm. Right now, before you came, some of you had a view of this as a farm. This is the correct view. It's whole, it's alive. That soul is a living system. Okay? Now, these slides are out of place here, but let me show you real quick. And I'm going to make sure you guys are going to get a break because I can tell you're going to need a break. But this one is, I got to get this slide right because. I was in a hurry, and you know what happens when you're in a hurry, right? You put things together, okay, here we go. Now, now when I go over the country, farmers tell me all this all the time. <laughs> they don't understand. <laughs> Wisconsin's different, we've got different salt. Fred, you don't know, you don't understand, it's too cold here, we can't do cover crops. We can't do no cover I go to other parts of the country and say, it's too dry, right? You don't understand. You don't live here. I grew up in a dry climate. Don't tell me. They tell me it's too hot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, Todd, everywhere, this is the first thing farmers say. It's too wet. It's too dry. It's too cold. How many times have I heard that? <laughs> I hear that every time our soils are different. Mm -hmm. No, they're not. You do not live on the planet Mars. <laughs> Guess what? We're doing no-till all the way to Canada. They're doing no-till in Afghanistan. Yes, there's microbes in the desert. I actually went and did a talk in Arizona, and then he wanted me to come, the NRCS. said, Greg, we don't want you to come down here because we don't think we have microbes in the desert. I said, do Georgia, Arkansas, they get 65 inches of rain. North of those work. <clears throat> and covers. Now, here's the thing I want you to start breaking the shattering. When I went to college, they taught me this. Now, Ted, you went to school. Where did you go to school at? And you, what was your major? Aggie Aggie Thank God you went to Aggie I'm sorry. <laughs> are you a partner? Are you an agronomist? You probably went to Stevenson Club, right? Five And some of the universes were better than others, but I'm not. Uh, <laughs> and here's what I was taught. See, you were taught this big I was taught in soil science that the physical, biological, and chemical are equally important, and that organic matter is the most important thing. Would you agree with that? Yeah. How many agree with that? Hey, have I any followers? Yeah. Yeah. Follow? I used to think the same thing. I was like, I use track trick question. They're not here. Thing one. It's biology builds the organic matter, builds the structure, and when the biology builds the organic matter, it regulates the chemistry. They're not equal value. Let me give you an example. That's the planet Mars. Chemical, physical. Earth, chemical, physical. Is there a difference between those two planets? <laughs> Biology. Life rings. Biology modifies this planet, guys. I'm not saying chemical and physical is not important, but biology changes it. It modifies it. It builds the organic matter. If I take plant out, Mark, if I take the plants out, and if I take the soil biology out, what do I have? Mark. Geology, <laughs> chemical, physical. They're not equal value, not in my mind. What we're teaching now is this. Now look, I, one of the best books, one of the better books I've read was The Biosphere by Vladimir Verzlisky, brilliant biogeochemist. He said, the greatest geological force on the, on the planet 
planet is life itself. Now, producers, how many, Tom, I won't pick on Tom here, because we, and I'll pick on all of us here. Tom, is, is that a compaction machine? That's <laughs> <laughs> a compaction machine, isn't it, John? So what farmers do to fix compaction? Casey? How do they fix compaction? You pull out the big steam contractor and rip it. Don't How does that plant survive in that compaction? How many have actually seen that actually in life? I grew up in the Rockies. You see that? I see that all over the, the southern part of southern Missouri. We got them for a lot. And I see this. So how does that plant survive in ladies and gentlemen? Did you know those plants are our best for microwave fungi? Did you know those plant roots give off CO2, come in contact with water, release carbonic acids, break the rock down? Did you know that fungi break rock down? Did you know that bacteria break rock down? Yeah, right. They break it down. How do you think phosphorus becomes available to your plant? Who do you think makes zinc available to your plant? Do you think they just happen by a magical potion? I took graduate level soil chemistry and I walked away thinking there's a little under flowing all over the way. That's not the way it works. They make it available. Biology is powerful. This is Australia, ladies and gentlemen. Brian, you think we have it rough? You think we have it rough? I think I have it rough. This is Australia. You know what that is? An old calcium carbonate bed. Audience, sir, why is it black and black? That's gypsum. An ocean of gypsum. That part of the land, how can by that far in front? How come it's dark in the front? Carbon. Carbon. Life, you're right. Please, the reason I'm saying this, please understand the power of life in the front. What we've been doing is we've been killing it every moment we turn around with our fingers. I'm going to take you back a little bit of history. How many were born by before 1986? Raise your hand. A lot of us. Who were born after? Raise your hand. Do you, do you remember this? Not exactly. Not exactly, right? <laughs> <laughs> you the young Remember that? You know, I was 25 years old. Do you guys remember when that came out? It exploded. Big explosion. The tongue, the uranium went all over the place. We were frightened. Remember that? They said they were going to be death for a thousand years. Nothing was going to live. And actually, it, eight kilometers, just all forces just died, decimated. All cities and communities were evacuated. Thousands of people died. Look at it now. That was the biggest toxic load you can imagine released in the natural system. And look at it now. Fox are coming back. All of these. And it's still radioactive. You go there, the gag and still going on. And how come the biology is surviving that? You know what we have become? Chemophobes, physical phobes, we're phobic of everything. And the life is powerful enough. We use sanitizers to keep it on our hands because we're afraid of germs. Life is powerful, ladies and gentlemen. Go and Google Chernobyl. It's only 40 or 50 years. And the natural system has recovered. I have more hope for Chernobyl than our agriculture field for healing. Why is that? We're not farming. There's no men and they're not farming it. <laughs> Our birds get killed, pesticide, chemicals, fertilizer all the time, and there's no recovery time for it. We give it no break. This is what I'm trying to tell you guys. The more you blow the natural system, the more money you will make. Now, this is what we're trying to do. We want this biology to survive. We want, this is where I missed it. Look at this right here, this beautiful earthworm. This was taken in a no-till field in Canada. I never knew earthworms 
going to do that. We are actually taking the corn down and putting it into the, into the orifice. And what they're doing is farming. They're actually bringing the residue down. And then they're letting the bacteria break it down in the protozoa. And they, they come and eat the bacteria in the protozoa. They're farming. I'm telling you, once your soils get really healthy, now in my garden, I do not walk out there by myself unless I have a small handgun. <laughs> They'll take you down. How many have a residue breakdown problem? Raise your hand. How many have a problem with residue breaking down in your farms? Here's how you fix it. You ready? Not fertilizer, not tillage. Cover crops. You start the cycle, bring the biology, they'll break the residue down. When you have a residue problem, that means you have a diversity problem. Okay? It's these guys that break your residue. They do it. Mm -hmm. Chemical fertilizer and tillage does not do it. You trash the house. That is their habitat. This is part of, all of them are part of the nutrient cycle. When you do tillage, you sever this beautiful network. This network of fungi communicate, and they're the ones that bring the phosphorus, the zinc, the organic nitrogen, and bring it back to you. They do that. But when you run a tillage machine and you're not careful with fungicides, you hurt these organisms. You gotta be careful with them. Now, because of time, we're gonna skip, and I'm, I'm, I got the point across with biology. Let's get down to some more important things that you guys can grasp. That will, I mean, you guys grasp a lot of things, but here, let's go this way. Okay, now, there's four things I want you guys to focus on. I'm going to start out with this one. This is very, very critical if you're going to make money in agriculture. Okay, careful with your disturbances. Killer side, hanging, pesticides, and all these are hard in the system. Brian, why is hanging so hard? I don't know. How many, why would hanging be so hard on the soil? Anybody? Very general. Traffic. Mark? You're removing huge copious amounts of carbon, you're removing the calcium, the phosphorus, and that, but here's the worst part. You're taking all, what you're doing is you're removing and hurting too much carbon, you're taking too much carbon and you're hurting the cottage cheese. You're taking too much carbon from the system. Taking too much carbon. In fact, a hay field, if I had a hay field over here, it would actually have as much runoff as a till field. So what do we do? Ah, ready? If you brought your PayPal credit card and I got a little machine, I would tell you right now. No, I'm just telling you. <laughs> <laughs> ready? Don't cut so low. Graze it. Don't take the last cutting. Let it grow. Let the animals urine and defecate. Urine microbes want urine. They want manure. They want food. Chemical fertilizer will not fix it. They don't want that. They want food. They want the carbon molecules at the back end of that cow. They want saliva. They want the life. When you run your machine, don't cut it all the way down to the dirt. Raise it up. It's those simple things you can do. Don't take from that field every year. Feed your bales back where you took it from that hay field called bale grazing. That's what I do. Take your carbon back to where you took it from. Don't hang. Buy it from your neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. I will not buy I will not, I will not own Haiti. I used to own it. I will never do that again. I will buy it. I guess I'm Brazil. <laughs> <laughs> I would love your carbon. <laughs> Most of us don't realize that every bale you take on, you remove forty dollars worth of nutrients when you remove it. Poor poor dear. How's that right? Show you some stuff that you can do. I'm mixed. What we're doing, we have, we're going, because that's a critical. And that's why, in every situation, we can come back to multi species mixes. Remember, 35% of the carbon that feeds the soil is the residue. 
The most important thing you can do is put them in roots. So I'm going to help you with that right there with Kevin. Let's get down there real quick. So, the disturbances. If you heard the mycorrhizae, you heard the springtails, the whole system collapses because it's connected. Now you have to write more checks. Please understand, if you hurt one organism, you hurt the other organism, you hurt this other organism, they're connected. Be careful how you do business. Now, let me give you an example. Costa Rica. Look at, the, look at all the insects. All those insects serve purpose. There are 1,700 beneficials for every cat. How many of you have? Let me say it again. In the natural system, our planet has 1,700 beneficials for every test. Now, look at the grasslands in, in, in South Africa. Look at Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> so you create a system and you kill all the beneficials, you kill the self healing self-organizing, self-regulating system. So next thing. So here's the thing. Here's the thing that everybody should write down. So you know how to manage the disturbances on your farm. First, I use the acronym FIST because we like to force nature. It's your frequency of your disturbances. That's why I tell organic farmers, if you're killing every year, it will not work. You're hurting the system too bad. Or good organic no-till, for it to really work, you should be killing killers every once to four years. Three to four years. Your rotations have to be long, and you cannot make organic no-till work without this. Animals. Sorry, you cannot make a hand to work without the animals. If you're killing every year, you're destroying too much carbon. You're creating too much meat. Your system's going to go down. Frequencies of your disturbances are brutal. Let me give you an example. Your body can handle acute stress. I have some people that you will drink beer, North Dakotas. You do not drink beer with North Dakotas. But of course, you're Wisconsin, right? <laughs> I have some friends that can drink 10 beers to one to me. If I hang around them the whole night, I, my body goes through what you call a chronic stress. Your body was designed to handle acute stresses, guys. Lifting weights is an acute stress. You were designed to handle an acute stress. A chronic stress is this. If you eat poorly, you might get sleep, and you do it continuously, you're going to get sick. That's called chronic stress. So if you're always spraying, you're always chilling, that's chronic stress, the system will collapse. Your intensity, vertical till, is a lot easier on the system versus cloudy. Now, organic farmers, how many organic farmers raise your hand again? Okay, organic okay, guys. If I had to do my tillage, when would I do it? Nathan? When would I do it? Very little, but when would you do it? When it's cold. Why would I do it when it's cold, Nathan? Microbes are asleep. And microbes are asleep. Very good. So they don't eat your lunch and eat the house down. Careful when you do your tillage. The scale of the farm. If you plow up the whole farm, you create a huge amount of chronic stress. If you would have tilled just one field and moved your tillage around occasionally, scale means everything. So let me tell you how people spray right now. This is how we do Insecticide. When you have an outbreak, what if, when you have an outbreak, right, Mark? The army member comes down. So the farmer comes down and says, he tells him, go up. Instead of just spraying one field, what does he do? Spray the whole farm. <laughs> and then the neighbor finds out you're spraying, and they spray their farm, and they never spell it. That's like me telling Mark, I said, Mark, I want you to take chemo just in case you get cancer. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way we do pest management. We're hurting the biology. You're hurting yourself. Time means everything. Okay? Just to show you, I'll give you perspective. This is by Dr. Rakowski from Minnesota. He did research on tillage. This right here is 2,848 pounds of organic matter an inch of residue. This was the previous wheat crop. One more plowing not only consumed 
but it puts you in the negative almost a thousand pounds. One pound. <clears throat> Look at two discs. Look at the disc curl. Look at the chisel block. Look at no time. Why was there carbon consumed even though you're no time? The soil eats food. So when you kill, not only do you burn the house down, you get rid of all the food from the previous year. Okay, so write this down. Those who are really interested. Uh, your body is self-regulating, self-healing, self-organizing. Why do all of us not have cancer? Do you know what cancer is? When your body no longer self-regulates, self-heals, self-organizes. Your, your farm is the same way. <clears throat> when you put too much chronic stress in it, the body no longer heals itself, it doesn't organize itself, it doesn't regulate itself, you get cancer and you die. The soil is the same one. Okay, now I'm going to jump here. Here's four things you guys need to know when I walk into your place. You better have these four things working on your operation all the time. Mark, when I went to your place, I wanted to see if you were capturing chemical energy. Do you know how I know this? By your rotations. If your rotations are poor and you don't have cover crops at the end, you are not capturing chemical energy, and you cannot capture chemical energy, you're not building aggregates, and you don't have a functioning water cycle. You don't have a functioning water cycle, you don't have nutrient cycling. And you can't get that, right? You can't get diversity. See, diversity is what pushes energy through the whole system. It pushes energy, matter, that's where the sun flows through diversity. Now, write this down. This is the number one thing I watch on a farm top. Do you know how long the farm is very healthy and making money? I look at all the indicators, but this is the number one thing I watch. If your farm is running on new sunlight versus ancient sunlight. Todd, what is ancient sunlight? Fossil fuels. Petroleum. Fertilizers, pesticides. When your farm is flowing with the natural system, guess what? All your inputs go down. Now you're safe and making money. You're not capturing sun. You're disrupting. Hey, right. and we interface it right here, guys. Right on ground level. So if you're overgrazing, you disrupt all those cycles. I can, I can tell you the majority of the grass lines here is overgrazed. I walk and I drive all the time and see overgrazed, overgrazed, overgrazed. I see this. And then you have this, you have nothing to feed the microbes. We want to be here. This is overgrazing. Weeds kick in. You go buy fertilizer. Because your pastures look, they're overgrazed. You're taking too much. You're taking too much carbon. You're not building enough cottage cheese. You start having problems. Solar energy. Plant and soil are one. This is your job. This is a root leaking liquid sun. This is my job. Covering the soil. This is why I put cover crops up to soybean. This is why I put cover crops right up to corn. This is why I manage my grasses. Right here. Because I'm leaking and feeding microbes. It's all about that. It's that simple. Why? This is why I don't worry about my manures anymore, Tom. Those are my fertilizer patterns. Those are made of protein with bacteria. They multiply every 20 minutes. They can cover the planet in oceans of bacteria. They multiply very quickly because of this. <coughs> First carbon, and then them. They make the nutrient cycle go. And they process the manures. They process the urine. They feed the plants. That's why I don't worry about the manures. Let the manures be on top. There's a reason why 
the good Lord didn't have a petition for the buffalo's blood. He knew this, he designed the system, leave it on top. The dung beetles, the earthworms, all the critters will take it down. They do their job. Let them do their job. Every time you go just to that 20 bucks an acre. And then you're destroying the soil at the same time. Which farmer is making money, ladies and gentlemen? That is, um, I, that is Illinois. That's Pennsylvania. Which farmer is making money? Which was capturing their nutrients and feeding their microbes? Unfortunately, most of the Midwest is this one. Wisconsin is the same way. We're spilling sun all over the place. So water cycle, we're losing, so our, most of our planet is getting heat up. This is my part of the world. Now this is to be covered with grass, now all bare ground. Millions of acres, and then we wonder why we say the planet's not heating up. It is heating up. Because the sensible heat reflection is heating up and squishing the clouds away. Our water cycle is disrupted. Millions and millions of acres are not crusted. This used to be a prairie. Now the water cycle. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to show you just one more thing and then we're going to go down my farmer's regime. And then we're going to open up the question and answer public text. Because this is true, I can't give you all this information. It's just, this is a three day school. And I wish you guys could go through it. But it's amazing that people are not willing to invest in their education, but yet they'll go out and check for $50,000. It's amazing to me. Water cycle. We'll see that tomorrow. How many are coming tomorrow? Raise your hand. How many are not coming tomorrow? Have you ever seen the big rain simulator, Tom? The big one? No. I'm going to do this for you, okay? And then we'll push on. To fully appreciate the potential runoff and erosion from a conventionally tilled field like this, you really need to be out here during the most intense thunderstorm of the year. Since most people aren't willing to do that, here in Virginia we use a rainfall simulator to help our farmers tell the story of what happens when it rains really hard.
the demonstration, it's amazing to see how much more runoff occurs on the continuous overgrazed pasture versus the well rested rotation grazed pasture. Here you can see how much more water actually soaks in and absorbs under the rotation of grades well rested pasture and how much more water actually runs off. Okay, class. I see you guys in the back almost in a coma. Maybe we're going to show some more slides and I know I'm going to ask you guys back here. We need to kill. Why is there so much runoff? It's just overgrazed. There's no tillage. You need to show you the aggregates. <laughs> You didn't kill the aggregates. What's going on? This is the same principle for hay. Is it the roots? I have no argument, and that's part of it. Anybody else? The cover helps. It slows the rain down to the right. If you walk on top of that soil, if you walk, if you've seen it, I'm sure Mark's seen it, you see a lot of bare ground and more basic fields, right? That's only part of the answer. Take a look. Ready? Lack of cottage cheese aggregates you too, too much. That's why hay is so far in the land. Hay does the same thing. Those are carbon based molecules. You take too much carbon, you cannot build aggregates. It takes a lot of energy to build aggregates. Now, let's show how we can fix it. We talked about nutrient cycle, it's biology, and we've got diversity. Now, I'm going to show you how to produce this. Do it because it's getting late. And let's talk about solutions now. Let me show you how farmers are doing it throughout the country. This is the part that gets everybody all they love it. Okay, now. Okay, now our goal is to mimic nature. I'm going to show this little video that we're going to show you all the little things that we're going to do to fix it. This is the goal. This is the new science. Biomimicry is innovation inspired by nature. It's the process of looking at something like a leaf and trying to figure out how to make a better solar cell. It's become popular in the design disciplines, mainly, I think, because people are looking for more sustainable ways to do things. An organism knows how to do this. After 3.8 million years, Life has learned what works and what's appropriate on the planet. And right now, that's what the people trying to redesign our world are looking for. What we do in biomimicry is we bring in biologists to the design table. We look at how does nature contain liquids? How does nature how repel water? So for instance, go outside, look at any leaf and the veins in a leaf, and what you're seeing is the world's best water distribution network. There's an amazing thing called the Murray's Law that says that all branching structures in the natural world, including our lungs, they all follow a single mathematical formula. And it has to do with the pipe branches, and it drops down to a smaller diameter, and then it branches again, and that drops down to a smaller diameter. And that's predictable. People in building, green building now, are starting to say, well, Maybe our 90 degree angles that we have in plumbing are really friction devices. Maybe we should distribute electricity differently in a building, water differently in a building, even, even gases, even air conditioning differently in a building by mimicking this Murray's Law in, in, our, in our plumbing. The most important thing that people should know is that a sustainable world already exists. We're just now beginning to open our eyes and realize that the answers to the questions we've been asking, how we live here sustainably, are all around us. Hey, here's the goal tonight. Every one of us should wear a t-shirt that says, I'm a biomimicker. I'm a farmer and rancher. You mimic life. You mimic nature's template. Let me show you how farmers are doing it. Okay, first we're going to create a skin. If you go in the forest, the skin is always covered. If you go in your lawn right now, if you go to that lawn right here, if you pull it aside, guess what? There's residue. There's a skin. 
Let me show you how farmers are building that skin. We're doing it through multi-species mixes now. Where do we learn this? We learned this from Dr. Adamir Kalahari. Jay Fear, the district conservationist, and Gabe Brown were the first ones to bring it into this country. I picked it up from them, spread it all over the country. We are mimicking the prairie and the forest, and we make our mixes look like this. We feed the pollinators, we feed the biology, we bring ecological memory. Let me show you how farmers are doing this. In Tennessee, that is a multi-species mix. They are no tilling corn and soybean into that mix. They are capturing sun, diversity, covering the soil, and then that residue of that no-till planter rolls that thing down, you plant the herbicide, and you can use a roller, and you terminate the cover, and you create that natural skin, biomimicry. We're also using that tool. What is that tool? Anybody? Aerial seeder. It's an aerial seeder. When I went to an organic conference, they said, it's a cancer machine. <laughs> and everybody started laughing and I said, that cancer machine drops cover crop seed. And they go, whoa. They were so excited. We're doing that on standing corn. Farmers built that. Once they understand it, look what they're doing. That is dropping cover crop seed in standing corn. Why are we doing that? Right there. So when winter comes, I have a cover, I'm feeding my microbes, I'm holding my nutrients, I'm not having leaks, I have less, I build in cottage cheese, I'm building aggregates. I even did it with my, in my backyard in North Carolina. That is my roller. My daughter's Jenna. <laughs> <laughs> you know why I did that one? The farmers are like, a little bit of the equipment. <laughs> I use my daughter's Jetta on my backyard. <laughs> and because I believe right now in the integration program, there's my reducing bridge back. <laughs> Part of the system. I terminated that cover with no herbicide. I hit it at the right time, right at the dough stage. <laughs> my daughter was not happy. <laughs> I don't know why she was so upset. Hilarious. <laughs> now, my daughter, my very unhappy wife, <laughs> she's my gallon pressure. <laughs> so, that's, that's, that's why my daughter, that's my backyard. I Five acres. I planted my corn right into their three point hitch and my lawnmower as an old planter, no till planter. Rollers are becoming huge, it's spreading. This young this lady is doing it with a two by four and a, and a board, rolling the cover drop in her garden. How much horsepower do you need for a roller? Plenty. <laughs> Look at the difference in soil temperature. Why are we running out of carbon? We're running out of energy at the end of the season. The soils get too hot. There's not a capture of water. That's why we can't maximize our yields. We're doing it in the West with cotton. Look at the look at that serialized amniopathic against pygmy. Look at that. It's increasing our yields for cotton. We're doing it in tobacco. We're doing it in corn all over. Our no-till planters cut right through that skin. Tony Pitterick, a friend of mine, Watertown, Wisconsin, <coughs> look what he's doing. I said, Tony. But Tony and I went to teach all of Wisconsin. He didn't want to show this video because he was, because the neighbors gave him so much flack. Look at Tony's doing. This is Tony this year. This is years, that was last year's picture. He has no problem with, look at his, look at the corn pop right out of here. We're also doing, Bob, hold on a second. 
just I'm just taking the slides here. I want to show you the those who did tillage and those that did not do tillage. Slides are out of, out of sync here. Let me see if we can find this. I want to show you the ones that do tillage. Ah, there we go. Uh, sink here. Sorry about that, folks. Here we go. Raise your ear for pasture. Yay. And we go. And here we go. This is Tony this year. Now, the guys that did tillage, now this is his soybeans. This is Tony's soybeans. No chill right into it. <coughs> this is how it looks when you terminate that cover. Having that natural skin like the forest and the prairie. Look at the corn pop right out. Those who did tillage. What is that weed, Mark? Water. Water damage. It's killing them all over. Their neighbors are they, they, they had to have nothing to kill them. Look at Tony's. We saved farms and markets. Pigweed was killing us. There's no herbicides that killing them all pigweed in Arkansas. You know what saved us from? They saw stratification, they saw compaction, they saw those issues. That's because we forgot the most important part, the covers. Look what happened with three years of covers. That's what went from this to this. The soil health scores went up by 50% in less than three years. Respiration, that means the cycling went up 279%. A 40% increase in consumption of carbon and food. Those, those soils are cycling. Tom, if you trip in those fields, they'll consume you. <laughs> they have no problem with resident breakdown. They're cycling, they're, break, they're reducing their thick chem, chemical nitrogen inputs. Now, last one, wrapping it up. Crazy. Now, if I'm a big biomimicker, what would I want to do if I want animals? I'm going to mimic the Serengeti and the buffalo. Biomimic. Let me show you what we're doing. We're moving herds, large herds like this. Our, we're moving our cattle like this and sheep. We're doing the same thing. A lot of people say, well, animals compact the soil. Compaction is a function of time. Time. You're keeping the animals in the same spot too long. You're overgrazing. We want to run, we're running anywhere from 250,000 pounds to the acre, all the way to a million pounds to the acre. Why? For this reason. We want this. Manure and urine distribution. The tighter I group these animals, I have a cow pie here, cow pie here, I want a urine patch in between. But if you let the cows do whatever they want, you have a cow pie here, and you have one at the end of that wall over there. You don't feed micros from here to here. I want to feed them. Notice no bare ground. When I go walk into a grazing operation, if I see any bare ground, you took too much. You better have no bare ground. This is what most people do. Build the fence with the cows, and I'll see you in about three days. They pick and choose a stop set. What we're doing is this. We call it adaptive grazing. We are breaking our paddocks to that size. And you don't have to do it all the time. If you can do it once a year, you feed the microbes, you don't have to buy any fertility. Feed the microbes. Let me show you what they're doing in North Dakota. That is not a black pipe. That is Gabe Brown's pals in North Dakota. They get 100 inches of snow. They get about 60 to 19 inches of preset. But uh, most of it comes in the snow. We now are not only bale grazing, but we're doing multi-species grazing, and we're grazing the mixes in the field. No pain. Let the cattle graze. They have legs. We allow the animals to do this. By doing this, producers have reduced their hay. They graze with no additional feed until January 3rd. It started from November 29. That saved them $60,000 in hay by letting the animals graze the mixes out in the field. Look at them graze, they have legs. Let them be, they're not pets. Let them dig in the snow. This is what we're doing, they're getting the radish, the 
protein content in some of those cover crop mixes. Look at the crude protein. Excellent. These animals are doing well out there. Does that look pretty good? That looks pretty darn good for consistency that they're getting a balanced ration in these cover crop mixes. No baling, no hay. The animals go out there and do it themselves. That is a cover crop mix by Jerry Dunn. It's 300 acres of a cover crop mix. He mows one side and just, just accept, uh, put a hot wire, let the animals graze it. He does it for the deer and for selling. And then we also have here in Wisconsin, we have a guy that's doing adaptive grazing with the, his dairy cattle. The wave of the future is low input agriculture. Animals that do well on grass. People want no antibiotics. They want raw milk. I, right now, in my house, I spend $180 a month on milk. My family drinks $180 on raw milk a month. And we're glad to pay it. It has no crap in it. People want good milk. They want food as medicine. And yet our dairy people are going broke. They're dumping the milk into the raw suits, and yet our guys are going broke. You know what people are pushing for, guys? Food as medicine. I pay six bucks a gallon, and I don't complain about it. But once I didn't drink raw milk for the last year, I didn't grow up, I grew up drinking homogenized crap. When I first drank raw milk, I went, whoa. <laughs> Life is good. <laughs> last, last thing, and I'm sure we'll shut up. How powerful is adaptive grazing? I just got back from Chihuahua National two months ago. Some of the best grazing in the world are from Mexico. They only get six inches of rain. <coughs> Guys, I want to show you that's Las Cruces, New Mexico. I grew up there. That's part of the Chihuahua Desert. That's my, our college has the largest land in all the universities. They own more land than any other university. I was born in 61. I didn't realize. Now look at this. This is the way it looks now. So you know what the government decided to do? They blame the cow. They take him off and make it worse. It's not the cow. The cow is like a giant buffalo. If the cow, the soil needs manure and urine. Let me show you what the people in other parts of the world by using animal impact. Before and adaptive grazing afterwards. Before, afterwards. Moving the cows in like buffalo. They break the crust, urinate, defecate, bring the biology back. We call it using a mobile lead. The ranchers are going to get their good spots at the ranch move the animals, and they restore it and bring it back to this. Also in Mississippi, this is one producer we bought a beat up farm that's been tilled and cottoned to death, brought the cattle in, in less than four years, and restored it from this to this. Animals. Okay, last one, last three slides, and we're done. This is Chihuahua, Mexico. It is hotter than hell. It is one degree from hell. <laughs> How many have been to Chihuahua, Mexico? Anybody? It's hot, isn't it? It is hot. I'm like a farm there. <laughs> this is my home state. I grew up in the northern part. College is right here where I showed you the Mexico state. Right here. This is where we're at. Look at the problem with most of that part of the country. It looks like this. Eroded, overgrazed. Doesn't that look like my home state of New Mexico? I just showed you that. Look what they did with animals. They took this kind of, they had the same problems. Erosion. How can they have such erosion issues if they only get six inches of rain? It's all crusted. This is what they've done. Six inches of rain. Grouping the cows like buffalo. I was blown away. Look at, those, look at the way those animals look, Brian. In the desert. Here you live, you live in the promised land. These guys are doing it. How do they do it? They group the animals. This is Fernando. 
He speaks excellent English. He got a degree from Colorado State in biogeochemistry. His wife's American. This is his wife. Look at the ranch coming back. The deserts are turning back into prairie. Look at it. Coming back to the deserts. The wildlife's coming back. How do they do it? With cowboys. They are excellent managers of livestock. They know animal husbandry, like we talked about right now. They know how the animal works. And they only have a couple of cowboys. They move to 70,000 acre ranches. They move all these thousands. And look at the smothering the mesquite. And they're bringing the grasses back. And smothering the cactus. It is amazing. Last slide, and we're done. Ladies and gentlemen, here's the, here's the final thing. And I hope you guys take this to heart. I couldn't go over the whole presentation, but that's fine. Ladies and gentlemen, the illiterate of the 21st century are, are those people, it's not those who do not read or write. It's those who are not willing to learn, unlearn, and relearn. When I got to spend about five minutes in the ride, you left to learn, unlearn, and relearn. Ladies and gentlemen, I have hope. If we can turn Chihuahua, Mexico back into a prairie, can you imagine what we can do here with a beautiful place like you? With all the water? I think you guys can actually make money and bring the son and daughter into the operation. That sounds pretty darn good to me. How about some questions and answers? About five minutes of it, or five or ten, as long as you guys can last. I'm here. You're paying for the whole day. Are you going to give me a big round of applause for that?
Then they did this thing. I will not do it in the way. Or we're going to, we, that's why we're having major water quality issues. Why do you think they asked me which people you want to kill me? I had a group of pissed off people. Half of them were urbanites, half were dairy guys. They were pissy moody. Because they're having, they're having major water quality issues. The moment I showed them the demonstration, guess what happened right now? They all calmed down. You should have seen their whole demeanor. Both sides didn't know what they were talking about. Both sides were wrong. And at the land end of the top, somebody yells, but it's the farmer's fault. And I said, no, it's not. USDA taught them this way. Extension taught them this way. We taught them in the 70s, get bigger, get bigger, get bigger. Society wants cheap food. We aggregated, we pushed the farmer down this direction. So I said, you have an option, you want to, Kelly? Sue each other, hate each other, kill each other, or work together to fix it. And guess what happened? People started smiling, they want to work together. We had it wrong. Every one of us had it wrong. We weren't mimicking nature. We put nature like a factory, we made her into a machine. Now we're reaping the costs. So we gotta fix it. Guys, the most powerful thing we can do, even if you're still utility, if we can cover that ground, at the end of the year, you've done a huge thing. Cover the stinking ground. If we can do that, we've done something huge. Do you know that a 30 to 40 percent of Lancaster County in, in Pennsylvania is covered? You know 40 percent of Maryland is covered? They're paying farmers $90 an acre to cover the ground. Think that bothers them, they're doing it for the wrong motive. They're getting paid for it. You should do it because you're making money. You make money with these covers. Because you're feeding biology, you're praying in the soil. The plant needs it, the soil needs it. And so that Tennessee farm, that Tennessee county, 40% of that county is covered. One district conservationist. One motivated young man, 40% of that county is covered for less than three years. Yes, sir. The only way I get farmers to do this is to pay them to get Yeah. Pay. Yeah. Here's what I want. If we were going to invest in one thing, one conservation practice, somebody said, Ray, you only got one practice you can do. What would you choose? Because there's... Look, some people want to push people to organic. Organic's complex. You know what the number one question I'm asked all the time? How to be an organic no-till. That is the most difficult thing possible. Cannot make it work without animals. Not on a large scale, it won't work. That is the number one question Dave and I get all over. Organic and no tip. Why do they want to go organic? The money. People want the way to the future, guys. I get to be around millionaires from California to the East Coast to the West Coast. You know what they want? Quality of food. Those who can grow animals with antibiotics, raw milk, my daughter paid $11 in New Mexico in Albuquerque for, for a gallon of raw milk. And we're making it illegal. You get handcuffed if you, if you want real food. Why? Because people are afraid. People do a bad job. They might not be super clean. It's not the cow's fault. Then they, then they push. What do they push? Don't eat meat, don't eat raw milk. Because you're going to have heart problems. Isn't that the case? It's sugar in raw coffee. Food is causing problems. Not real food. That's the way of the future, guys. I see the way of the future going to real food. People want it and they want to pay for it. And there's a lot of people with a lot of money. A lot of money. And they want, and they want, and I'm telling you, they're on your side. If they know that, why do you think organic is growing 25% a year? Do you know that? Pasture raised beef, we cannot meet the demand, and they're having to be exported from Australia and the rest of the world. And then our farmers are going broke and we're really making money here in the beef. <laughs> it's frustrating. Our rules and our laws and our program, and guess what, guys? The consumer is also to blame. Do you know how many it's pesticide applications of insecticide or open an apple? 30 to 40 times. Why? 
An American will not eat it if it's got a hole on it. Oh, it's got a little brain on it. We have to re-educate everybody. It takes huge amounts of pesticides to have a blemish, uh, not have a blemish on an apple. Me, if I don't have a blemish, I don't want it. But that's what we're teaching our people, see. But I'm, I'm telling you, this is where the movement is going. You need to decide where you're going to be in your operation. I tell you, more humanic nature in the way we the world has turned out, why do you think non-GMO? A lot of producers are going non-GMO. My top producer in North Carolina won the yield contest. Non-GMO corn, no-till, five years cover crop. He never grew up on the farm. He has a high school education, won the yield contest in 2016. 318 bushel of corn, non-GMO, with 140 units of end. Five years, no chili covers. Why is he so good? He doesn't have bad habits. But he picked up from mom and dad. And he is very determined. Now, I want you guys to think about it before you leave. Don't do cover crops if you're not committed. I rather you be beholden to the man, to the government, to the chemical guys, and everybody else. Because if you fail the cover crop, I'm going to tell you, you will fail. You will have a mishap and you'll blame the covers. Don't do it, please. Don't even bother. If you're not committed by like this young kid, Russell Pickett, if you don't have this kind of commitment, don't do covers. This is how committed he is. His last field, he got heavy rain. He could not run the equipment out there and it was already in December. That's late in North Carolina, even in December. That's way late for coverage. That young man went to a local hardware store, hired a bunch of high school kids. They did a bunch of hand seeders and seeded 40 acres by hand. He did not want that down there. If you're not that committed to it, don't do it. Where did he find 40 kids in the work? They were flying over. No, no, you know what they were? They were kids from uh, the trouble kids. They had no choice. <laughs> But here's my point, guys. If you do not treat your covers like your corn and soybean, it's going to fail on you. You're not committed. You don't understand the system. I don't know how many tell them farmers say, Ray, I don't want to be very expensive. I said, You don't know how the soil works. That's how it eats. That's how I use cyclonutrients. That's how I get you off the planet. That's how I reduce your pesticides. Cannot do it without the cover crops. Won't work. You don't understand color and isolation. You don't understand that. You should be blind. 
You don't know how the soul works. Your second question is, uh, if you go on Facebook, there's some, uh, there's Lawrence Steinrich from Iowa. He is doing inter, he's doing intercropping soybean and wheat right next to each other or cereal rye where you can actually, your intercrop, when you're running out of time, like Iowa is there, your intercrop. So they're harvesting, now they're thinking about 16 inch corn or 16 inch soybean. Intercropping. People have been doing intercropping all over the world, except in the United States. This research has been around for a long time. You know why we haven't done it? Because inputs were cheap and because we were Americans. Now we're going broke. So now intercropping is becoming very popular. Intercrop. Interseed. Go buy an interseed. Never leave that ground there. That is your worst enemy. Tillage, too much chemicals, and bare soil kill you. I'm broke. Other than another question. <coughs> yes, sir. Mark. Timeline to bring this up, up to effectiveness. I mean, you said the guy was four years to get to that yield. He finally. No, it just doesn't happen overnight. I, yeah, like give me. I, here's what I tell you guys. I mean, this comes. You give me three to five years of covers, you change your life. Three to five years, your know, soil will change. Those ones in North in, in Tennessee changed in three years. When we grew covers that tall. So, but here's what I'll tell you. <clears throat> your soil will change on the function of your understanding. How committed are you? How much integrity do you have not to give up? So I'm going to dump it on you. How committed are you? I tell you what, I've, I have several producers, they get excited, they get all wound up, and they have one problem with cover crops, and they crash and burn, and they blame the cover crop. They never understood the system. They were never committed. I'm going to tell you right now, guys, it is hard. The system I'm telling you is hard, but I think you have to manage. I'm not going to tell you this is a panacea. You have to think, and you have to manage, but the rewards are amazing. It's called hope freedom. They're worth it. Please tell me anything that's come easy. It, it, you're going to have to think. You're going to have to plan. You're going to have to time me. Yes, sir. John. So if you're script traveling and you're doing corn beans, say, ordinary food. Yeah. So when you do a cover trap, are you using that cover trap full season on the ground? The whole yeah, and, and as much as you can. So you're, you're taking strips out of production for the cover, right? You see, here's what's beautiful about having cattle the same. When those cover crop crops are going, you see, remember, please guys remember, the resident is 35, the resident that, that you leave on top of the surface, only 35% of that makes organic matter. Only 35%. The rest of it goes out in CO2. The big deal that changes everything is the living root. So the more you live a longer living root there, the more you're saving. The residue is important. That's why haying, if you do an occasional haying, you don't hurt it. But if you hay every year, the same thing. From the you hurt it. So what you're trying to do is put living root and push more carbon into the system, give more than you take, then your rewards are going to be great because then you can dump the inputs. See what we're see. We're all stuck. We're thinking we're making money by more yield. No, you don't. Net profit. We had a guy in, us, in, in Arkansas, 275 bushels, under a pivot, made no money. It's your cost of your inputs. I have guys that manage a boat that's $150 less a seat, and they make like a lot of $75, $100 less. They manage a boat. They cut the fertilizer in half. 75%, they're using second size, they're using fungi size, they're down to 100%. Start out with money. The people that don't like this message, I think it's people that sell your stuff. And I tell co-ops, sell cow crops. There's more money. People want you to make it for them. There's, there's money for everybody. But for far more ecological. Yes, sir. So given what you just said, is there a role, is there a, a role for cover crops in a uh, full season grass? Good question. Okay, we have festival down in, 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 in 
of in Missouri. Uh, my buddy in Missouri has got fescue too. In my area where it gets real hot, fescue just sucks. I think mean, it just goes down and the end of fight increases. We come in with a summer mix. See, when, that, when the cool season just starts to peter out, we come in with a summer mix, the summer mix grows right out of it. Millets, sedan grasses, and then our biomass goes way up. No fertility, just a no-till drug. Well, it's not, it's not a winter crop in that case, it's a mid-summer crop. Yeah, so here it's going to be more difficult to do that because, see, your fescues don't go dormant, right? It's too cool. Am I wrong? Do you ever have fescue go dormant? We, we just, we don't have a lot. Good, so you, but your grasses go dormant. I mean, do you, okay, do they go dormant here? In the, yeah. Okay, they do run them onto a drill, put some millets, some sedan, some cow peas. Oh, you love it. We know to right into it. Just when they start going dormant, don't buy any fertilizer. I do cow peas, I do millets, I do sedan grasses. Warm seasons, man, the biomass. We have one uh, guy in Ohio had 18,000 pounds of biomass. No fertilizer. Wow. Seven or eight million minutes. When you, when you come to my school, when you come to our school, we teach you how to design your business. There's a school happening next week in Minnesota, in Redmond. Our website is Soil Health Consulting LLC and Soil Health Academy. If you ever want to go to our school, I'm not promoting myself. I don't care if you guys go to our school. I really don't. In fact, I had one producer one time in Louisiana said, really, our schools cost Twelve hundred and seventy-five dollars. Well, wait, that's a lot of money. I said, I don't want you to pay. Because what do you mean? Offend it. I said, go pay the hundred thousand dollars check for fertilizer. You want a twelve hundred and seventy-five dollars school to get you free? Really? I don't want you. You know the Canadians. Let me tell you. We just got back and filled the school up in Canada. You know the exchange rate is thirty-three percent higher. Those guys paid sixteen hundred dollars for the school. Education guys is the best thing you guys can ever do for yourself in inspiration. I will pay you about it to get raised school. Education, whether it's a nice shop in the ground or a soda prep, school, you all really want to learn. Invest your in yourself, guys. Invest yourself in freedom. So we teach you how to run the, I also have a soda test that I'm not trying to go over that will help you save all your, a lot of your food. We now can measure the organic nitrogen. We have a test to measure all the, we've been missing 50% of the nitrogen. We now can measure it using the, if you guys use the Rick Haney test, write it down, at Ray Ward Lab, just follow that, I'll save you 20% of your nitrogen this year. Ray Ward Lab, do not use any of the lab. This, this test was designed by USDA ARS, by Dr. Rick Haney, I'm the one that promoted all over the country. You'll, when it test costs 40 bucks. And some people say, well, it's 40 bucks for schools. I said, don't call me. Please don't call me. Don't waste my time. So here's how you do the test. Six inch deep. You only take the test when you get ready to apply your fertilizer. You take the soil sample, six inch deep, take a bunch of cores, mix it in a five gallon bucket, and send it off. You do it when you're ready to apply your nitrogen to your corn. Don't take the soil test until the soil temperature is at least 60 degrees. The microbiome processing. Take the soil sample and then you're going to get two soil samples back in one sheet. You're going to get the old test and you're going to get the new test. Let me show you. Real quick. We were going to go over it but we didn't have time. Here it is. Okay, it's going to look like this. The one in red, it says traditional evaluation. The traditional soil test on this particular field, he said he only had 19 units of N. The Haney said, no, you got 55 units of N. The difference is 36. That's a $23 an acre savings. Do not follow the old test. Follow what the Haney test tells you. If you're going to do 200 bushel corn and you put 200 units of N, 200 bushels, uh, 200 bushel, you want 200 bushels of corn per acre, <coughs> per acre, 
You get that, you multiply, you want 200 pounds of N, you subtract the Haney test, you got 144 units you apply. It's that simple. That simple. Do not use the old soil test. They're way off. They were wrong. They were based on biomimicry. This test is based on biomimicry. You come to the school and teach you how to understand the test. I don't have time for that. What I do today is get you hungry. Change the way you see things. Guys, you're done with you. Let me do the last two. There's a holistic planner. He made this statement. And I have it in my PowerPoint. I'm using one of my favorite quotes. If you want to do small changes on your operation, change the way you do things. But if you want to make major changes, change the way you see things. Guys, you're dealing with a living system. It's dynamic. It's alive. It responds to you. Careful the way you treat it. Nurture it. Flow with it. Understand it. And you can be very well done. There's money in that Nature never puts her eggs in one basket. It's never a monoculture. All the farmers that are the most successful in the country will tell you this. They have animals in the system. They have four or five enterprises in operation. That rancher, Jerry Dunn, every son, before they came back to the ranch, every son had to bring an operation back. One of them bought hunting. The other one bought a, a wedding for the weddings. The other son bought another being diverse ecologically and economically. Thank you. Missouri, six, seven hundred miles apart. And these soils came from northern Missouri. These soils are from this farm right here. Okay? So, the two guys right here, notice Ben and Dusty are the heavily disturbed dudes. They're going to drop them into the cylinder. We're all going to drop them at the same time. Okay? Now, this test is called the slate test or aggregate stability. We know about aggregate stability since the 1930s. That's what's so disappointing. We've known this science since the 30s. 30s. Okay? Now, the way this works, each... How, by the, before I do that, let me ask this, honestly, for the audience. How many of you 
garden. How many have a garden? Okay, how many use a rototiller? Come on, fast side. How many do a no-till garden? Wow, I'm impressed. How many do a no-till lasagna garden? I do that too. Okay, now, how many here are conventional farmers that still do rotational tillage? Okay, how many do no-till? How many are organic? Okay, good. Now, how many integrate animals into their cropping system? It's absolutely amazing. It's phenomenal. Okay, now, now that I got a feel of you guys to see what's going to happen. Now, when Dusty goes to the doctor, the, the doctor says, Dusty's not feeling good. They'll say, okay, Dusty, you're very complex. So I'm going to do a urine sample. I'm going to do a blood sample. I'm going to do a colon sample. I'm going to do all kinds of stuff on you because you're complex. I want to know those indicators of health to see what's wrong with Dusty. The soil is the same way. The slate test is an indicator to tell us about function if the, if he, if the soil is working. Okay? But it's the most visual. Now, I want to give you perspective so when you go do it, and if you don't get the same response, please understand. It's how you collect the soil. You've got to air dry it. You've got to get all the water out of them. Okay? Even stick it in the microwave. I've done it and it still works. You can even stick it in the microwave. Okay, so here's how it works. You get the soil air dry. We're going to drop it into the cylinder. The soil, as the water rushes in to fill the pore space, it should not fall apart. The water's rushing to fill those millions of pore spaces. When that water reaches in there, we want porosity. Pore porosity. If the pore starts to collapse, that is not good. That means no porosity, no infiltration, the water's going to run off. Everybody with me? I don't want it to break up. I want it to stay nice and clear. Good? Let's drop it in gently, guys. Uh -huh. Now, let's look at a Missouri, a Missouri soil. What's happening to it, the tillage? Now watch this, it's gonna start falling apart. Now it's gonna stay clear here, but it's gonna start falling apart. Now he got this at the fence row. And you're gonna see that the soil is gonna start falling. Look at that, just barely touch it. The two field soils are falling apart. Where we till the soil, by the way, tillage is the most destructive thing we do in modern agriculture. I have a new name for tillage. Tillage side. You know what the word side means? To kill. Pesticides, fungicide killed the fungus. Herbicide killed the plant. Insecticide kill the insect. Tillage kill the habitat. Kill the house. Disrupt. This one, these two soils do not hold calcium. These two soils are addicted to fertilizer, to herbicides, to pesticides, to fungicides. They are not balanced. They do not have a balance. The fungi and bacteria are, are, are not there. This one's have higher organic matter. This one will hold calcium better. This will hold carbon better. This will hold water better. Every 1% of organic matter I build, I can hold 20, 17 to 25,000 gallons of water. I'll say it again. Every 1% of soil, I can hold 17 to 25,000 more gallons of water per acre. Per acre. These soils will not hold water. I'm going to show you in a little while, they do not hold water. They will run off. There's no pores. There's no glues. Who makes the glues? So what happens, let me tell you how tillage does. When you run the tillage machine, you inculcate oxygen into the system and you wake up these bacteria called R strategists. These R strategists, bacteria, they're like, I call them the teenagers of the soil. They're dormant. But the way, the moment you till, you put oxygen, you wake them up. Have you ever seen a teenager they could be asleep, and the, word, and the moment you say the word pizza, they're up and eat. 
Same thing with these bacteria. They're, the bac they're the teenagers of the soil. You wake them up, they start eating the glues, they eat the organic matter, and the soil starts to fall apart. And then the glues and the carbon go off as of CO2 into the atmosphere. We, we take and we destroy organic matter. Why does the soil do that? I am personally convinced, I cannot prove this, but I think it's a self-healing, self-organizing, regulating mechanism. Let me tell you what I'm, I mean by that. Does anybody know what cancer is? Mark, what do you think cancer is in the body? Unregulated growth of cells. Beautiful. Cancer is when the body can no longer self-heal, self-organize, self-regulate. The body does it all the time. The soil is the same way. When you till the soil, what it wants to do, it wants to self-heal, self-organize, self-regulate. So what does it do? It will cannibalize itself. Bacteria will die, release nitrate into the soil, and then the weeds, the healers, and the scabs come up. The soil is trying to cover and protect itself. So the first defensive mechanism is weeds. So I walk into an operation, I can tell right away with a shovel in a 30 minute conversation, I know where you're at. If I see weeds in your pasture, you're overgrazing. The scabs are telling you that. If I have problems with weeds, you're doing too much tillage. The weeds are indicator species. And so you're caught up in a vicious cycle. Look how this is starting to fall apart more and more. So everybody please understand, when you till, you create more weeds. There is a reason why the highway department uses a disc to make roads. It is a fantastic way to destroy the pore space and destroy organic matter. Tillage is a great way to destroy soil and destroy the habitat. Nobody's ever told you that, huh? Ryan said, yeah, sure, but you're doing smoking cover crops too much. <laughs> let's see, let's let the water speak to us. The water is speaking to us. Let's take it a little further. Dusty? Ben, you ready to pour? Yeah. Okay, come on, open the lid here. You're going to pour. Now, I'm going to get out of the way here a second. Okay, now these are our same Missouri soils. Okay? So let's see which one they are. Well, we'll, we'll let the soil speak for itself. Okay? I put these soils together and I can't tell now. Oh yes, this is the conventional. That's the no-till. Okay, you're gonna pour. Now, it rains, when it rains from the, when the clouds, when the rain comes down, it comes at 15, 20 miles an hour. We're only gonna make it rain six or seven inches. And I wanna know which one allows the water to go through what we're doing is making this miniature water cycle. We're going to make our own rain and see the soil. We want the water in the soil. I don't want the water at the river or the lake. A healthy, functioning water cycle is when the water goes into the soil. I never knew that the completion of the water cycle, bacteria had something to do with it in the fungi. If I don't have big pores, the water cycle is not working in the soil. The first one inch is critical. I don't care how much tile drain you put out there. If you don't get the first inch right, nothing else works. Let's prove that. Pour. See, I used to think if I till, I would make more pores. Were you taught that way? I was taught that way. Oh! Why? Look at the no-till. What the heck? That's, that's no till. That's conventional. I was telling you better. Stir that soil to make the pores to make it infiltrate better, don't you? Weren't we all taught that way? We were all taught that way. I was taught that way. I used to design these huge pivots. And I remember getting a phone call from the office from the farmer. He said, Ray, don't you know what the heck you're doing? Said, Whoa, what did I do wrong? Well, your pivot package, the amount of flow, I turned the water on and all the water went off my field. I had not known he had dished the living tar out of it, destroyed all the 
blues, destroy the organic matter. At that time, I didn't know nothing about soil function. I could have never defended myself. He turned that pivot on, is exactly what happened. All the water ran off. All of it. More than the majority of the water ran off. And I couldn't sit there and defend myself. This is happening globally, ladies and gentlemen. We have a disrupted water cycle because we have a dis diminished carbon cycle. They are intimately connected. You cannot separate the carbon and the water cycle. Cannot do it. Just like you should not separate the molecule of nitrogen and carbon, they, they really are sisters. They're, they're related. Now look at this right here. Same soil, they're 15 feet apart. Different understanding. This farmer doesn't understand soil function. This farmer understands soil function. This farmer is mimicking nature. This farmer is not. Nature does not invert itself, it does not till. How does it, what equipment does it use to aerate the soil? Colton, what does it use? I'm calling on you guys. I think Earthworms. you guys are. Earthworm, absolutely. What else? Ants. Ants, roots, critters, beetles, dung beetles. You know what I like about all the critters? I don't have to put diesel in them. They don't have to come, they don't complain. They show up to work all the time. All you gotta do is feed them. Oh no, we gotta make it better. We gotta go disc it, screw up the whole system. And then we go write a check to the fertilizer company again. I don't know about you, but I like writing the back of the check, not the front of the check. <laughs> so the thing is, the more we leave it alone and make it, we start writing the back of the check. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the reason why we are unhealthy as a people. This soil can hold nutrients. This soil holds nutrients because of the fungi and the biology. This is why if we don't have healthy soil, no healthy plant, no healthy animal, no healthy human, no healthy climate, no healthy water. It's all intimately connected. See how our reductionism has done? We reduce things into pieces. So this soil, if I walk in this soil, we'll show you in a little while what's going to happen in this soil. Look, I still cannot get it at all. These are the same soils. Now, let's take it a little further. So, make it clear, when you till, you wake up bacteria, they eat the glues and the organic matter. Everybody with me? And the moment you do that, then they release nitrogen, and then you stimulate weeds. You know what bothers me, Dusty? I was, after I got out of my government job, and I would go out there, and my wife said, well, what are you going to do? I'm going to go out there and run my tractor and run my disc. I was destroying my soil and spreading weeds everywhere. I was doing it ignorantly. Now, let's do some more. Now, Ben, uh, are you, do you do, uh, are you a farmer? Nope. And you, what do you do? Work for Lane Country Farm. Oh, okay. Colton, you farm, right? You're an organic guy, right? Okay, you're going to have to do this. Colton is going to do a little bit of tillage. And so, Colton, this is the this is the this is the cornfield from Brian's place right here. He does a little bit of vertical tillage, right? And and it's continuous corn, right? Okay. We both grab it together. Now, Colton, I want you to do like. The typical organic farmer does. I want you to do some tillage. Well, I should say all of us have this, not just organic farmers, okay guys? I, I just want to make it clear. I came from a conventional background. When an organic farmer came to my office, I didn't know what to do with him. I'm just being honest. When an organic farmer came to my office, the government employee, the organic farmer, oh, what do I do? I'm serious. Because how do you farm without chemicals? And you know what's the number one question I'm asked, and Gabe Brown and I get every time in the email, how to do organic milk That is the number one question out there. Let's see why. Do some tillage for us, loosen that ground on the top, and see if you can get that water in the okay? He's he got this tillage down, doesn't he? Very good. 
and you're listening to the radio and you got your cap on and you see that bellowy smoke and you're feeling good because you're accomplishing something, right? Yeah, and you're feeling good about it. It's like, it's like a good old German community in Indiana. They judge you by how many weeds you have in the downs block, right? Yeah, I've been there. I see that. It's not just there, it's in the West, too. Let's see how good you did, right? Huh? Now, we've already done this two or three times, right? This is wet. We've already done this. You saw this yesterday. I just did it with the kids just a while ago. Let's see if it works again, okay? Now, we're gonna make it rain. Ryan, I'm gonna let you pour. And since you did the tillage open, because you know you worked that ground pretty hard, you, know, you spent a lot of diesel. Yeah. You were really proud of yourself to run that good work out there, right? Okay, now, please understand that this is the grass waterway right next to the field. Right over here. This grass waterway has not been touched for a long time, right? Now, you have run the equipment, maybe have a little bit of compaction on it. It is right next door to each other, same soils. Let's see what happens. Go ahead and pour. And then we have incredible slopes over here, don't we? How do you think this is going to affect our trout streams? What do you think you're going to carry with it? Sediment? Do you know the number one water quality problem in the nation still is sediment? Do you know the Soil Conservation Service was once called the Soil Erosion Service? A natural now it's called Natural Resource Conservation Service. Do you know why they started this agency? We're right here. We were having massive winds blowing and carrying the soils from the west, Midwest. There was no glues in those clays and sands, and that's why it blows. When you no longer have those biotic glues holding the sands and the clays, guess what happens? It blows. It erodes. This is why the Mississippi looks like this in the southern part of the country. I just drove here from Missouri, and I crossed, and I said, that's the Mississippi? It's beautiful. Where you guys are at, it actually looks like a river. When I'm in Louisiana, and by the time it gets to Missouri and St. Louis, I can walk across it, <laughs> filled with sediment. <laughs> Why? Because we treat the soil like a machine. It's just dirt. It's not alive. It is a living, dynamic system. It is the fungi, the bacteria, the earthworms, and all those critters create the glues. So what hurts the glues? Tillage, fallow, bare ground, insecticides, fungicides, the chemical fertilizer, all those are intrusive tools. Not one time did I say not to do it, did I? I'm not organic, I'm not a no-tiller, I'm none of those. I'm a promoter of understanding. I just happen to love no-till because it mimics nature. And I love the organic people because they, they, they knew years ago something was wrong. We were spraying too much. But guess what? Both groups are not sustainable. And by the way, what does the word sustainable mean? Let me give you an example. Matt. I asked Matt, Matt, how's your marriage? <clears throat> it's sustainable. <laughs> Matt, life sucks, man. <laughs> now, what if I asked Matt, I said, Matt, how's your marriage? Man, it's regenerative, man. You know? I wake up every time, and I'm next to that beautiful woman. I'm always growing, it's changing, it's living, dynamic, it's always getting better. See the difference between the word regenerative and sustainable? You have to regenerate first before you can sustain. We are not sustainable, and I don't care what group you are. If you're over applying your tools, you are not sustainable. And I don't care if you're organic. I don't care if you're conventional. It doesn't matter to me. I love you anyway. I had an organic group says, Ray, thank you for not beating me up 
about tillage. It's not my job. My job is this. When you run that tillage machine, I hope you break out into a rash and it hurts. Then I know you understand. You're going to figure every way to reduce the tillage and the sprays and the chemicals. I'm good. Do you see the difference? Now you understand. You see it differently. That's my job. You have to figure out a way how to be careful with your tools. We're not finished. Let's do another one. Guys, you line up right here. We're going to get some more water here. You guys line up straight. I've got another demonstration for you. Okay. There we go. Okay. Just line up that way direction to the, towards the audience. Like a mug shot. Okay, go the other way then. The way that way. Okay. In there. You're getting my lid right now. Oh, what happened here? I can't find the right lid. Stop. It's got holes. I'm looking for the wrong ball here. Okay, now let's pour it. We're going to make our own little cloud. Okay, we got the cylinders right here. Give me one. Put, open, you hold that one. You hold that one. Okay, now we only got one rain cloud, so we're going to do this. You scored half of this. Okay, you're going to do it like this. And then we're going to pass this to Ryan, and Ryan, you're going to do the other half, okay? We usually do it to get a horse. Let me see if I can find that one more time. And is anybody, we have a bottle with the holes. Yep. Okay, hey Chris, you want to let me borrow your thing here for a second? Let's put some water in that, baby. Let's see if we can get it to you. We'll make him a big rain cloud. And we'll, we'll cheat against, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be vicious. We'll, uh, we'll put more rain on the no-till soil, okay? We'll just, I mean, let's think of this like a hundred-year storm. And we'll, and, we'll, and we'll just be rough on the no-till, okay? Ryan, now get close, you guys. Put your fingers there. Okay, now, now remember, the low disturbance team, the very disturbed team. Look at Ben, very <laughs> disturbed. Ready? Rain. Isn't that amazing? How important those clues are. Look at the difference in those same soils 10 or 15 feet apart. Blues, very little blues. Balanced soil, not balanced soil. Healthy soil, not a healthy soil. See the difference? This is why we have wind erosion. This is why our rivers look like chocolate. The sands and silts and clays are not held together anymore. The blues are been consumed. So our job is to build blues. You know how long those blues last in the soil? 27 days. I have to be able to glue all the time. So how do we fix it? There's one more demonstration. Now, you guys move aside here, Ryan, the rest of you guys. Dusty looks like he's just a manly guy. Let's get Dusty to do this one. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is called the scum test. And, then, and so how do we build blues? We know now that the fun fungi, the bacteria, all the critters, they're the glue makers. I gotta feed the glue makers. So how do I feed the glue makers? A living plant. The ancient people called the plant the mouth of the soil. This morning we had some phenomenal pancakes by Ben. I mean, they were amazing, Ben. Now, if I had no mouth, I wouldn't be able to enjoy that fantastic pancakes. Ladies and gentlemen, the plant is the mouth of the soil. That's how the soil eats. So, these plants kept solar energy, photon light, and they converted it to chemical energy. 
and they leak copious amounts of carbon molecules and they feed the biology. They take 30 to 70% of that energy and leak it into the soil. Why would they do that, Edmund? That's a lot of energy. That's a lot. Why do they do that? What do you think? Feed the bugs. Feed the bugs, Travis. 30 to 70% of your... How many of you would like the government to take 30 to 70% of your check? And then he said, of course, they already do that. That's a lot of energy. 30 to 70%. Why would the plants do that? They have to change the environment around them. Their first job, they want to attract fungi and bacteria to them so that they can build relationships so they can get a hold of the nutrients. They say, okay, I leak these carbon molecules and then the fungi says, I will bring the zinc and the minerals to you. Let's how, see how that happens. Now, what I want you to go in there, get this. And I want you to get that claw in there. Okay? Go ahead. That's a good job. Like you're washing a pair of dirty skivvies there. <laughs> All right, fantastic. Now pull that up. Now, just put that there. Now tell the audience, now come up here. Down. You guys see that white foam? How many have seen that in the stream? Those are those super molecules from the soil, the glues, the super, super, I call them super molecules. I do not like the word organic matter. It is a very poor name because we don't even know some of those molecules yet. They are incredible. Now, hold there. A good old cocktail there, a little margarita, soil rita. <laughs> Now, pass that around, and I want you to see that film. Pass that around. That film is hundreds of compounds leaking into the soil, feeding soil biology. And the more I leak compounds like that, the more cycling I get. The more cycling I get, the more cottage cheese I build, and the less fertilizer I have to buy. The more carbon, the more nitrogen is available. I have farmers now that do not buy chemical nitrogen. <clears throat> I said that again. They do not buy chemical nitrogen. Where are they getting the nitrogen from? They're getting it from the soil biota. These organisms, there are organisms that produce nitrogen and they make no association with the plant. We're just finding that now. We've got legumes, we use manures, we use urine. They are feeding the soil. I don't have to write a hundred and twenty dollars an acre check for fertilizer. How? Cover crops. Do you know that when I say cover crops, most farmers know what they do to me, Travis? They get, I ain't doing no cover crop. I smile at them and I tell them, Todd, you don't know how this works, do you? A majority of our producers, including myself, did not understand how this all works. The soil does not work without the living plant. Corn and soybean are not enough. Corn, great crop. Good fibrous root. Soybean just leaks nitrogen, has a really poor root system, not enough carbon. So what can I do? Every time I, so what I can do is I can shorten my varieties in my corn, daylight days, Instead of growing 106, go to 90 day corn and plant my cover crop mix at the end. So I have producers in Pennsylvania and further north of you, here in Wisconsin, as they're no-tilling, as they're harvesting their beans, they're running the no-till planter right behind me, planting their cover crop mix. And I put more grasses and legumes I think in my mix. Acoustics. Now, can everybody see? This is really important. I'm going to tell you the movement that we have that has created the soil health movement is by these demonstrations. These demonstrations are so powerful 
I had one producer convert his whole operation, 30,000 acres with this one hour talk. Converted his whole operation. Once he understood this has changed our agency. It is changing our country. It's not only changing our country, it has gone viral all through the globe. These demonstrations have done this. It is the soil speaking to us and resonating to us and finally collecting the, dot, the dots to us. I started using these demonstrations about 14, no, about 15, 16 years ago because I knew I only have a couple of minutes to connect with you and show you and let the soil speak to you. Are you guys ready? Thank you for helping me, Matt. Appreciate that. The nice thing about it, you don't say a word, man. All you got to do is drop a clot. It's pretty cool. I had one lady, she was such an introvert. She goes, no, no, I'm not doing this. Because... Now, come on, Jen, get close. You guys can look close to me. We're going to go ahead and we're going to do it. I'm in the way. Let's move, let's move the table just a little bit. Without, let's, let's lift it up. Let's make sure we can do it without. Oh, oh, up oh, Tom. There you go. Yeah. A little more. I'm still in the way, isn't I? But, yeah. Excellent. A little more. Tip, tip that projector off. Okay. Oh, you're good. Can everybody see that? We're good. Okay, you shift it the other way. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Okay, now. I'm here, buddy. John? Tom? Both of you guys here? I'm going to stand on this side because I don't need to be here. Okay. I'm going to give you this is Missouri soil, no till soil. Okay. Jeff's going to hold the no till soil for me. John? We're going to grab, you're going to grab that Missouri soil. That's conventional tillage soil, okay? Corn soybean. Looks just like your soil, right? Tom? I want you to grab this soil here. This is the soil from, uh, we just grabbed it from um, Brian's field. And Brian, you do, it's corn, corn on corn, right? Yep. And you use a vertical tillage. Yep. Correct? And then that is the, we walked 15 feet into the sod waterway. Right. Correct? Yep. Same soil type. They're 15 feet apart. Okay? Now, how many of you garden, by the way? Raise your hand. How many still use a rototiller? Come on, fist up. Okay. Now, what we're going to do, this is called the slate test or the aggregate stability test. It's really scientists like calling it the slate test. The reason they call it slate is because of this. When we drop, just, if this is just water, just plain tap water. And what we're going to do is those clods are all air dry. Now, I want you to do this on your own operation. If you want to be really assess yourself, shovel, the slate test, and some of these things can tell you a lot about your farming. Now, keep this in mind. The aggregate and slate test does not work on all soils throughout the world. Areas that have very different mineralogy will not slake. That doesn't mean there's not functioning. Now, please understand it is one indicator of function. When you guys go to the doctor, the doctor does a lot of tests on you, don't they, Mark? Yes, they do. Boy, they've done a needle on you. They do fecal sample. They do urine <clears throat> sample. They do saliva. They run you through the mill. Have you ever pondered why they do all those indicators to determine function? Are you healthy? This is one of them. And it is critical and it's the most visual. Okay? Now here's how it works. These guys are going to gently drop these clods in the water. Now when you do this, it's got to be air dry. If you don't have time, stick it in the microwave. I want all the moisture out of the clod. We don't want any moisture. Okay? Now, because remember, every clod has millions and millions of pores. Okay? Now, I'm going to explain what's going to happen. These guys are going to drop them in gently. Water's going to rush in to fill the pore spaces, Tom. Water's going to rush in because it wants to fill that vacuum. Now, what's going to happen is if the soil is healthy, it will not fall apart. 
It will hold its integrity. It is, has the biotic glues. It has the organo-mineral complexes. You call it organic matter, are holding the sands and silts and clays together. If it falls apart, that means the pores are collapsing. If the pores collapse, no porosity, no infiltration. Everybody with me? I don't want it to fall apart. Ready? Go ahead and drop them in. This is Missouri, and this is our beloved Wisconsin. Okay? Now, now look what happens to that conventional tillage. Now this is beginning to start falling apart with the vertical tillage. Look at the tillage here. Now certain soils respond more negatively to tillage, but it always destructive. I will tell you the most destructive thing we do in agriculture is till. Tillage is tillage side. Side means to kill. When you use a pesticide, kill the pest, kill the fungus. Tillage killed the house. You're destroying the habitat. How is that doing it? Look how this is beginning to slake right here. So what happens is when you run that tillage machine, you run a disc or you run a vertical till, what you do is you infuse oxygen into the system and you wake up bacteria. These bacteria are designed to be in there. These are called copotrophic bacteria or our strategies. What they do is they wake them up and they start to consume the organic matter, all the glues, all the biotic glues, and the organomineral complexes. And then the sands and silts collapse and fill the pores. Look what happens. How many have seen rivers and lakes look like this? That's exactly what happens. So what happens is when the pores collapse, they get filled with sand, silts, and clays. The clays are microscopic. And then the first act of erosion is downward. We do not have a runoff problem in this country. We have an infiltration problem. Now the problem also with these soils, these soils cannot hold the equipment. There's no glue. You can't graze these fields. They have no integrity, no biotic glues. These soils cannot hold calcium well. They do not hold organic matter well. These are bacteria dominant soils. Now notice this grass waterway right next to each other. Look how clear this is. 15 feet apart. What's that first one again? No-till. Missouri no-till. How many years? It's been no-till for 20 or 30 years. And that, that piece of soil is five feet away. This is the grass barrier. <laughs> it's right like the same thing we just did here. We just walked 15 feet into the grass waterway. You know why this grass waterway? Nobody's farming it. They're capturing sun and living roots 24 seven. That is the biggest weakness we have in our agriculture. We till too much. We're not capturing enough sun and putting life root long enough. We're going to talk about it. We spray too much. Now one time, I am, I'm going to confess right here, I am not organic. I'm regenerative. I'm beyond organic. I love organic. I love the motive they started with. The organic people knew we were spraying too much. And they were right. Fungicides hurt the biology. Herbicides, you've got to be careful. Some hurt the biology. Chemical fertilizer hurts some of the biology. It lowers the pH. It's a salt. Tillage hurts the biology. Now, one time am I going to tell you not to till or to use chemicals. That's your decision. I'm telling you, be careful with your tools. It is our tools that are making us grow broke. Look at these soils. Look how clear. Okay, so let's make this, um, uh, and then we'll move to the next demonstration. These soils hold calcium better. These soils hold nutrients better. This one has more diversity, has more fungus. This has less fungi. Our visceral mycorrhizae fungi are critical. Tillage destroys the fungi. It severs and breaks them up. Breaks up the house. 
These soils cannot hold the nutrients. This is why we as a people are sickly. One of the reasons, not only because of our processed foods, but we don't pick up all the nutrients in the plants. These soils cannot pick up the nutrients. They leach. It's not accessible because the fungi are not there. The biology is not there. Now, let's watch what happens when we try to get it to infiltrate. Let's see, we need more water. Oh, okay. We'll grab quick here. I forgot to get a couple more bottles of water. Okay, there we go. Ready? Come. I'll let you do this because you're taller. Matt, you're tall. Okay? I want you to hold this too, okay? Now, you're going to pour water. Hold on a second. Now, hold it with both hands. Okay, this, now, Tom is the no-till, Missouri. Matt, you're the conventional, okay? So, when you look at Matt, Think of a disturbed, look at him as disturbed, not mad, I mean the toil. <laughs> Matt, my wife tells me I'm disturbed. Okay, when I use the word disturbance, I mean that's an ecological term, too much disturbance. This is the tillage, same soils. You're going to pour, and what we're going to do is we're only going to pour, we're going to pour the water, we're going to make it infiltrate, we're going to create a miniature water cycle. We want the water to infiltrate go the soil and go right into the container. See, the water cycle, ladies and gentlemen, is complete when the water goes into the soil, not the river and lake. The water has to go into the soil first. The lowest part of the watershed is the river and the lake. We want it to go through the soil first. You can't grow a crop if the water reaches the river and lake first. Okay, we want infiltration, right Tom? You gotta make money. Ready? Go ahead and pour. Whole bottle. The whole bottle. See, the raindrop comes at 15, 20 miles an hour from the sky. Oh, uh, what happened here? That's conventional. How many of us were taught that I had to fluff the soil so the water will infiltrate better? Raise your hand. All of you should raise your hand. We were all taught that. I would design a pivot, Brian, and I'm going to tell you, I designed irrigation pivots. A farmer went and dished and tilled the whole field, and I put a, a design package for the, for the pivot so how much water would come out. I get a phone call, and it says, Ray, don't you know what you're doing? I turned the pivot on, and all the water ran off my field. I could not defend myself. What happened is this. This is what happened. He dis and, and, and tilled the whole system. Why do you think the highway department uses a disc? It is the best way to build a road and a runway. You destroy all the pore space and get rid of all the organic matter. That's why you use a disc. And a vertical till is a glorified disc. You're destroying pore space. You're destroying biology. You're destroying the life of the soil and then we're going broke. This is addicted to fertilizer and chemicals. This soil, I have farmers now, do not use chemical nitrogen. I have farmers that have reduced, got rid of all their fungicides, no insecticides, and they only, they reduced their herbicides by 90%. Reduced their fuel by 66%. They went to no-till and cover crops. See, we sold no-till wrong. We didn't sell it as a system. See, no-till just stops the damage of the house. Cover crops feed the factory workers that make the glues. I had it wrong. I gave wrong advice as an agronomist for 20 years. So I'm having to spend the rest of my life making, uh, making good for all the bad information I shared with a bunch of producers. And they didn't teach me correct in college. If they would have done these demos in my college, they would have connected the dots. And my soil professor, who has a PhD in soil microbiology, didn't teach me this. It's frustrating and our farmers are going broke because of this. Overgrazing creates the same issue. Haying 
does the same thing to the, to the poor space. Hain is brutal. How many knew that? Hain is hard on the land. We'll talk about that. Hain is hard on the soil. I'll talk about that in a little while on how we can fix it. Now, making everybody real clear, before we move to the next demo, when we till, we wake up bacteria and they eat the glues. And guess what else they do? When those bacteria die, they release nitrogen back into the system and you stimulate weeds. Tillage stimulates weeds. The more you till, the more you're gonna have problem with weeds. Weeds are nature's healers and scab. It's the natural system saying, I am being disturbed. I have to cover it. It is the soil's safety mechanism. It wants to cover itself because it's being tilled. I no longer till in my operation. I do not use, for my garden, we use a lasagna garden. I'll tell you about that later. Now, let's do another demonstration. You ready? Yep. I think you can pour this one. John, you ready? Yeah, got the next one. Okay, now, this is the same farm right here, Brian's. This is the vertical till farm, and this is the grass waterway right next to each other. Okay? Let's see what happens. Make it rain, guys. And let's see what happens to that field. He just worked it with the vertical till. I just spent $70,000 on the vertical till machine. <laughs> and the water doesn't go in. We'll see how much water infiltrates on this one. And then we're wondering why we always have a drought. Ladies and gentlemen, we've done this on billions of acres. We have altered the climate. We've destroyed, we've diminished the carbon cycle, which has impacted the water cycle. How many know that 60% of our rain comes from the ocean? Did you know that 40% comes from inland? 40% comes from evaporation of plants and soils. It's called evapotranspiration. That's the water cycle we've diminished. That's why we have huge rains. We had in Missouri 25 inches of rain last April. We almost lost the bridges on my farm. It scared the tar out of me. It's the small water cycle has been disrupted and it's altered the big water cycle. <clears throat> this is what's happening, ladies and gentlemen. And then farmers tell me, Ray, I, don't, I, I, I can't grow cover because it just steals water. No, your soils are destroyed, it doesn't hold any water. Look at here, when you work that soil up, what you do? You destroy the cottage cheese, you destroy the house, you hurt the habitat. Let's see how much infiltrate. Can you show up on the map? Go on the bottom here. Zoom in here. The grass waterway, you got water in there. How about Brian's corn? And when he gets that rain, a majority runs off. And you guys have brutal slopes. Goes way off. Painful. You can't, we can't do it that way. So how do we heal it? I'm not finished yet. Let's go another demonstration. Ready? You four line up right here. We got another demonstration. So go straight. Okay, now you're gonna be a sport. You're gonna get you're tiny. Go on the other side, buddy. You go on the other side. Matt, you go in the middle. You're gonna be my rain cloud. Jed, you're gonna be the rain cloud, okay? You're gonna be a rain cloud. John, you get on this side, please. I want you guys to get close together. Put your hands together close. Okay, now you guys, let's switch them around. Let's keep Tom consistent. The low disturbance team, the very disturbed team. <laughs> yeah, okay. Now we're gonna raise it up a little higher. Okay. Well, we gotta make Jed. Can you reach higher, Jed? Okay, let's go down for, we'll make it for a Jed adjustment. Ready? Rain on top of it, Jeff. Squeeze it. Okay, same soils. One's no-till. This is the no-till soil. This is the conventional. Right next to each other. So the force of the raindrop 
because there's no glues, no biotic glue. See, those glues only last 27 days. Who makes the glues? The fungi, the bacteria, all the living critters, all the little critters you see on top of the surface, all of them contribute to these biotic glues. Earthworms help. Look at that. That's a good rain cloud. Look at Jed, man. <laughs> Jed, he makes a... Ashley, he makes a good rain cloud. Yeah, he does. <laughs> Jed, you did a good job. Look at that. Look. How come this clod's holding together? Look what happened to this one. Not much, huh? Now, that's good. <laughs> you did good, Jed. Let's look. Now, Jed, which one do you want to drink out of? <laughs> I don't blame you, huh? Same soils. What's the difference? The different understanding of the producer. One knows how to emulate nature, one doesn't. A majority of our land is like this, ladies and gentlemen. The whole globe is like this. A majority of our globe is this way. See, no till is not enough. I'll say it again no till is not enough. You have to do the cover crops. They are not optional. Now, one more demonstration. I'll tell you why they're not optional. Okay, I'm going to choose somebody that's tall. John, you want to do this one? Sure. Okay, John's going to do this one. Okay, Matt, I want you to focus right here. Okay, now Matt. Okay, so I got to feed my microbes. I got to build, I got to, I want lots of factory workers. How do I feed my factory workers? A living plant. What the living plant does is capture solar energy and convert it to chemical energy. It takes the sun and makes liquid sun. Hundreds of compounds of liquid carbon are fed into the system. Amino acids, sugars, proteins, nucleotides, hundreds of compounds to feed microbes. They feed the biology. The ancient people called the plant the mouth of the soil. How many of you could have eaten this morning, just a while ago, if I would have ripped your mouth out of your body? How long will you live? Do you know what happens when I drive across this country after corn and soybean? What do I see? Do I see any covers? Do I see any green? What do I see? I see black. Millions. Thousands of, and millions of acres. Black. No covers. No feeding of the microbes in the spring, in the fall, and in the, in the spring. Let me show you how powerful these covers are. What I want you to do, this is the grass waterway, no, this is the hay field. You have alfalfa, a little piece of alfalfa in there. This came from right there. You can see the alfalfa. Now, what I want you to do, John, is I want you to dip this ferociously in this, this brim, okay? And, and Matt, I want you to zoom in right here close. Okay, and I want you guys to watch this. Okay, now go ahead and dunk it. Just hold it. Yeah, and, and swish it around really ferociously. Just collect. There we go. Just shake it up loose. These plants leak 35, they leak from 30 to 70% of their photosynthetic material. 30 to 70%. That's a lot. How would you like the government to take 30 to 70% of your check? And, 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 and I had a guy, and John's exactly, they already do. <laughs> well, move to Europe. You'll get, for sure, you'll get that. Okay, beautiful. Now, go ahead and stop, John. Now, zoom in. Come here. Stand up, Matt. Jed, Tom, can you always see that? Stand up on top. How many of you can see that foam? When you walk by the stream in the rivers, don't you see foam? That's those biotic glues, those complex super molecules that the bacteria and the plants make. So you think about it. We get this beautiful cocktail of liquid carbon. And you scoop it up. Hold that right here.
Look at that white frothy material. Pass it around. Those are those compounds, those super molecules that are created by bacteria, fungi, living plants. That's what you see in your stream. That's what feeds the soil. If you move the cows correctly, cool. and you don't take too much from them, they can give those compounds so they can build the cottage cheese, they can build the house, build the infiltration. The more you overgraze, the more you till, the more you destroy, that is liquid sun. Cover crops are not optional. Corn and soybean do not cut it. Corn and soybean do not cut it. Corn's a wonderful plant. Soybean has very little weak roots. It leaks nitrogen. In fact, every time we grow soybeans, we do infiltration before soybeans, right after when we take it soybeans, and right after the infiltration rate drops in half with soybeans. Why is soybeans hard on the soil? How many thought that soybeans were really good on the soil? Raise your hand. I did too. Where in nature do you see millions of acres of mon uh, uh, monoculture legumes? When you go on the prairie, where do you, how much legumes do you see? You only see the legumes in the degraded parts of the soil. See, legumes leak nitrogenous compounds. The microbes get the nitrogen and they eat the cottage cheese and they eat the carbon. Infiltration rates go down in half. If you don't even know how to design your cover crop mix and you put too many legumes, you cause the infiltration to drop in half. I always put grasses in my mixes and very little legumes in my mixes because it hurts the infiltration rate. Too much nitrogen in the system. When you apply too much manure, when you put too much chemical fertilizer, you hurt the cottage cheese. Now, let's do another demonstration before we get, we'll get done. Let's do this right here. And one more demo and we'll sit down. Okay. Let's do this. Now, you come and look at this. So, the sun, we want liquid sun. That's why cover crops are not optional. So when you're getting that, you cut down your variety of your corn and day length, and then you, what you do is you come with a cover crop mix and you seal your rye. Cover that soil, never leave it bare. Feed these compounds to the soil. Then they build aggregates, build cottage cheese, build infiltration. Now, let me show you the difference in the cottage cheese between these two soils. Okay, last demonstration. What do you guys notice? No till? What does this one look like? It looks like cement or oatmeal, doesn't it? Notice the difference here? No? Now look at the here. Zoom in. What do you see? Let's pass it around. Look at the cottage cheese, those BBs. That is made by microbes, by living plants. This one, they're gone because they've been tilled and destroyed, been consumed. Let's pass that around. No-till, conventional. This one, the glues, these what I want. Now touch them. When you touch them, this soil sticks to you. This one doesn't. When you walk in a conventional field, I'm five foot ten. I'm walking into the, the field, I'm seven foot ten. This one, I'm not. Because it's got the super molecules, the glues made by the fungi and the bacteria. We missed it. Our job is to capture sun and stop the disturbances. Careful with the fungicides. Careful with the insecticides. Careful with the tillage. The goal is not organic. The, organic, the goal is not no-till. The goal is regenerative ag. Beyond both. The goal is that you understand what you're doing so you don't go broke. That's the goal. The only people that do not like this message are those, selling, those people selling things to you. 
I have nothing to sell to you except for freedom and hope. That's a pretty darn good deal, don't you think? Give these guys a hand, would you? Any questions, guys? Go ahead, Tom. You know, I yeah, we really like to be 100% notes when we tell them what do we do with all our manure. I was taught as an agronomist. Ray? Yes. Okay, we're reading. Uh, I'm sorry. Good, Brian. Tom asked. He loved to be no till but they said, what do we do with our manure? As an agronomist, they told me, we got we to gotta till in our manure because we're going to lose our nitrogen. How many were taught that way? All of us. That is ridiculous. Did the buffalo have a disc in their butt as they were going across there and go, oh, I'm going to lose a lot of nitrogen. <laughs> Guys, I don't care about nitrogen. I care about carbon. The, do not separate carbon and nitrogen. The more carbon you build, the microbes will make the nitrogen available. We are breathing 78% nitrogen. The microbes convert it. Legumes, manure, urine, they break it. We now know there are organisms that make nitrogen without any association with plants. Nitrogen is not my issue. Once I get my soil cycling, I will nitrogen will make become more and more available in the organic form. I will show you that in a little while. Carbon first. The carbon molecule. It's food. Carbon is food. Nitrogen the microbes use to process the food. Do not worry about disking it in. The fungi and the bacteria will break it down. They take care of it. The little critters on the top of the surface. And you know what I love about it? I don't have to put diesel in them. <laughs> they don't show up to work on, they show up to work on time. They don't complain. The bacteria and the fungi, leave them on the surface of your cover crops. Do not disc them in. Because if you disc them in, What you've done now is you threw a nitrogen source, you already woke up the bacteria, now you threw a five gallon tank of gasoline right into the whole mix. You already woke them up. Now they're gonna eat not only the house, I had an old ranch and said, well, Ray, I ain't gonna stop disking. I go, why not? He goes, man, when I teal, my plants get green. I said, yeah, you burn the house down to warm up a hot dog. <laughs> How retarded was that? <laughs> Turn the grill on. The grill is the cover crops, guys. Don't worry about nitrogen. That's why you grow the dunes. That's why you use the manures. It will be there. But if you sever the fungi and you smash it all up, they're the ones that bring organic nitrogen back into the plant. But you just dissed it all up and tilled it. You screwed up the whole nitrogen cycle. That's why we've been worried about nitrogen. Our soils are absolutely destroyed. They're not cycling on their own. How many have actually put chemical fertilizer on a field and it does not respond to nitrogen? Has anybody ever seen that? I have too. The soil is so healthy when you put chemical fertilizer, there was no response. I'm going to, let's make this very clear. 90% of nitrogen comes from the soil microbes. Let's make this another clear. We've known this research for many years, 1930s. If you put out chemical fertilizer, only 40% ever reaches the plant. Jeff, did you know that? When you put chemical fertilizer, only 40% reaches the plant. So what happened to the other 60? Ted, what happened to the other 60% of the fertilizer? It's gone, it leached. Majority of it, the mafia ate. <laughs> well, we still have to pay for it. The, <laughs> the organisms, they took it all up, and then they give it back to the plant. And we paid for it. I want to show you some new tests now that we are saving farmers hundreds of thousands of dollars. Let's get down this journey. Let's switch it around. Any questions when I'm switching around? Getting ready. I had a quick question. Yes, sir. So, 
demonstration here to me that looks like it's a lot of structural aspects of soil. Yes. I've diagnosed every soil tests in predicting soil health. They're poor. They're very, very poor. And the reason for that, it was our sciences. Our sciences were based on Newtonian physics and maybe chemistry. For the last three, four hundred years, we have been infected by our science of physics and chemistry. And biology got left out. It's not until the recent 20 or 30 years, because biology is hard to study. Let's just be, and let's just be fair about it. It's not all their fault. But then, but the mindset of some of the researchers like Newton and uh, uh, Jason uh, Bacon and some of these really brilliant scientists, their premise was wrong. They looked at nature like a machine. It's not a machine. It's dynamic living. So our soil tests are really poor and antiquated. But I got a new test that'll help you. It's based on biomimicry. <coughs> and I can cut just by you coming here, you use that test, I can cut 20% of your fertilizer as well off the top of the back. You pay for your little fee that you just came here. Easy. And you pay for dinner quite easy. Yes, sir. Um, I am probably most ignorant regarding farming, but I'm here because I'm concerned about flooding. Yes, ma'am. The no till versus conventional. Um, the one demonstration you can expect from the sea back here, the one that concerns me is the no till uh, soil and the water. It's hard to see if the water is going through the soil or around it in that tube. And if it's going around, is that going to concern me even more as far as... No, the, the soil, it's actually going inside. Okay. In the no-till, the aggregates are big. That cottage cheese, did you see that thing around it? Where's, where's, the, where's the little thing? Anybody have it? It's just about anything. Where is it? Let's do our Wisconsin soil and see the same thing happen. Open it up. Did all the water go in? It did, didn't it? Yep. Pretty amazing glues, huh? Now, we wash your hands right here. Okay, now let's go ahead and do that. Now let's give you one more demonstration. Okay, now I'm going to look at this water right here. Go ahead and wash your hands here. Look at this water still hasn't the water still hasn't sucked through. Well here's what we're gonna do. We can't wait any longer. Good. <laughs> now now I want you to look at the difference of the soils. No till and conventional. I'm gonna pass it around. Look at the cottage cheese. This is the cottage cheese. Bring, come over here. This is the cottage cheese I'm talking about. Look at those little babies. Look at this. This is what I want. And it takes carbon. It takes lots and lots of plants and no tillage. Tillage does this. Poor rotations do this. Fallow does this. Look how they stick. Go ahead and pass that around. That, the one that looks like mushy oatmeal is conventional. Here, here. So, let's wrap up this little session here. Tillage is destructive, bare soil is destructive. Careful with your fertilizers, careful with your herbicides, careful with your insecticides, careful with your fungicides. Careful, 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 careful. Now, that question. Uh, from start to finish, if I decide to go your way, yeah. uh, how many years? Ah. Three or five? So the question is, how many years before I can transform the farm? I'm pretty old. <laughs> <laughs> I'm right behind you. I got one, one foot of the banana peel and the other one of the braid. Right there, right, right there. <laughs> <laughs> I get asked that all the time. Some of us don't have a lot of years left. You think about it, ladies and gentlemen. If we start farming at 20 years old, by the grace of God, you may have 60 growing seasons in you. Right? We don't have much time to wait. 
So if farmers want this farm to change quickly, I tell you this, it is a function of you. How committed are you? How committed are you with those cover crops? I tell people, don't do cover crops if you're planting. If you're not as serious as you're putting that corn and soybean out, don't do cover crops because you're going to do it half-heartedly and you're not going to be able to withstand some of the failures you're going to have. But I will guarantee you this, if you're good with them, and if your covers look like this before you go in the winter, and you're planning to the spring, and I'm going to show you some pictures, I guarantee you in three to five years, you're going to change that farm. you never, it's not going to be the same farm. Well, you have to fail to learn. Yes, you have to fail. You fail all the time. You farm. <laughs> You farm and rant, you see it. Yesterday I got a picture of one of my dead sheep. Dead. That's life. I don't know why as Americans we have a problem with failure. It's okay to fail. Just fail slower. Yeah, I'm darn good at it. So here's what I'm saying to you. Give me three to five years of commitment and not give up. I was talking to a gentleman here who started no-till. Who was it? Uh, we are eating breakfast together. Are you here? Where is he? He's hiding now. Mark, was he Yeah, Mark. Where's Mark? No. We, no, no, it's not Mark. Mark's just... Dave, my first has been doing no-till. No, we were... Yeah, who was it? Dave. Uh, you've been no-till for a while, haven't you? Yeah, no, there was a gentleman here who's been no-till since the 80s. He left. He ate his pancakes and left. He, he, but I said, let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. When you first go to this kind of system, you are going to be looked at very like you're insane and left you out of your mind. So let's let's let me show you some pictures of how people are changing and how they're planting into that. Give these guys a hand, would you? Now, you guys did good. See, you can do anything special now. Well, excellent, you guys did really good. Now I'm going to show you what farmers are doing throughout the country and how they're planting. And then, and then what we're going to do today, we're going to break you out, and I'm going to show you with a shovel how to look at the soil. One of the most powerful tools. And when you come to my group, I'm going to show you how to look at the soil, okay? Is it, did it cycle through? Oh, what happened? It was just up There it is. Every time you look, it goes away. Oh. Thank you. Give me some water. Okay. Let's see if I can use this. Is the button on? Okay, there it is. Thank you. Okay. Now, producers, there are, there are eight principles I use. Three are towards you, and five are towards the soil. Okay, now, I'm going to make this very clear, the word ecology. How many have ever heard the word ecology? Have you ever heard that before? Okay, what does the word ecology mean, Kevin? All the things you have up there. Oh, oh, let's see the other. Yes. Eco. Study of the house. Eco means house. Economics. The money of the house. Here's what I'm trying to teach you. If you get the ecology of the house correct, the money becomes lucrative. You start making money. The ecology comes first, the money comes. But when I come to talk to you, I do not bring the ecology to you first. You know why? If I come to talk to Todd about ecology, he goes, man, that's a big He's smoking other brothers. But if I come to him from the economics, I got you. Then you fall in love with the ecology. Do you see how that works? Now, here's how that works. There are five things that I want you. When I walk on your property, Chris, this is the thing you memorize. When you, he's a new, young pathway NRCS employee. I am trying to brainwash him before he goes into the matrix. <laughs> <laughs> in a positive way. Because you are going to be in the matrix. And you have a lot of people that come to you. What I'm trying to teach you is how to mimic nature. Now I'm going to ask you a question. Before we start, now I want to be candid. I want you to be candid with me. How many of you were taught this by a grandparent, mother, father, uncle, 
professor, anybody that had great influence in you, and you said they knew you were going to get in agriculture, and they said, this is your job. Your job is to emulate, to mimic nature, work with it, collaborate with it, nurture it, understand its complementaries, understand its synergies, love it. Raise your hand. I don't think so, huh? Even in organic groups, I went and I asked the same question. Now, how many were taught this way? I can tell you this is what I was taught in college. I gotta figure out a way how to control it, manipulate it, genetically splice it. I gotta force it with my chemicals, and my fertilizer, and my herbicides, and kill it to death. Because I want yield. That's what I was taught. Agriculture was built on the wrong premise. I'm teaching the premise. You mimic it, you love it, you nurture it, you make money. You give more than you take. We start down the journey. These are the five things that I watch all the time. Number one, careful with your disturbances. Physical, chemical, biological, careful, careful, careful with your disturbances. There are unattended consequences. There is no singular effect. So when you do something here, it impacts this, 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 and this. That's ecology. Everything's connected. Everything is one. What does quantum physics teach us? Everything is one. Ecology, everything is one. Theology, everything is one. Understand the power of oneness. It's all connected. Even you, when you're like me, we're all connected to each other. That's kind of scary, huh? I don't like telling when people are connected to me, you know. Cover the soil. Cover it. All the time, the skin, that armor, it's got to be covered. No fair soil. A living root 24 7. The living root is the conduit of energy from the sun. You have no living root, you're not building cottage cheese, you're not building aggregates, you're having no nutrient cycling, you're not holding nutrients in. This is a struggle for many producers. Diversity, 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 diversity. What does diversity do? It is the conduit of energy for, it. it's the flow of energy in the system and the ecosystem. It allows nutrients and energy to flow from one organism to another organism. Diversity. Intercropping, polycropping, multi-species. Diversity of insect. I want diversity. The system was designed in diversity. The last one, integrate animals into the system if you can. Nature does not farm without animals, ladies and gentlemen. Every ecosystem has animals in it, except ours. We took the animals out. If you grow across the whole Midwest, all the fences are out, no animals integrated in the system at all. And these are towards you. I would have, as a government employee, I could not teach these three. It would have never been allowed. Adaptive management, holistic planning. What does that mean? Adaptive. Nature's adaptive. Survival is not to the fittest, but those who can adapt, change, adjust, learn, adapt. Nature does that all the time. Holistic planning. See the big picture. From the bacteria to everything. All of us, how many raise cows? Raise your hand, there you go. Just, and regular cows, cows. How many of you thought about the micro herd? Do you ever check their body condition score? You don't think of that, do you? Holistic. Now, here's one of my favorite words. Context, 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 context. You interpret everything within your context. I, when I walk on your operation, if I, I got to be at Mark's place, what, three days ago, Mark? Two. Two days ago, I went to Mark's place. I caught me in the radio station. He didn't know that he got a real crazy guy on his operation. So the first thing I walked into his operation, here's what I did. I understood, his, I wanted to understand his cultural context, his social context, his spiritual context. 
Do you know when you work with Native Americans and you don't with the Amish? It's a spiritual thing, the land. To me, it's a spiritual thing. You can't separate it out. It can't just be pure science. Cannot do it. Do you know when you go to the when you when I went uh, I grew up around seven tribes. And the first thing when they saw the demonstration, the tribal member said to me, Ray, you white men taught us to do it. I said, we were wrong. To them, the land is a spiritual thing. Most of us in our churches, why are we not teaching you about restoration of our souls and our land? It should be taught at church. And then the last one. This was a group. Cannot build. Now, Larry, you asked me, how long can I take? How long will it take me to do it? It depends on your integrity. What do I mean by integrity? Integrity, soundness of mind and character. How much are you willing to sacrifice to learn? Are you willing to go to a school? Are you willing to learn? Are you willing to study at night? Are you willing to learn to withstand the mocking of the neighbors? It takes integrity. Not give up. It takes integrity. It is a function of your understanding how your soils are going to respond. Your farm responds to you. It responds to your understanding. I can walk on any operation, including mine. It is a function of my understanding. It reflects you whether you realize it or not. So it's very critical we understand that part. Okay? Let me see if it doesn't work. Ah, it doesn't work. It doesn't have any here, right? Okay, let's go to the next one. Now this is the goal. This is the new science. And then I'm going to show you the demo. I'm going to show you how farmers are doing it. This is the science of the future, ladies and gentlemen. It's called biomimicry. It's biomimicry. It's the process of looking at something like a leaf. And try to figure out how to make a better solar cell. Yeah, let's see if we connect it. I wish I would have gone to this school. Biomimicry is innovation inspired by nature. It's the process of looking at something like a leaf and trying to figure out how to make a better solar cell. It's become popular in the design disciplines, mainly, I think, because people are looking for more sustainable ways to do things. And organisms know how to do this. After 3.8 billion years, life has learned what works and what's appropriate on the planet. And right now, that's what the people trying to redesign our world are looking for. What we do in biomimicry is we bring in biologists to the design table. We look at how does nature contain liquids? How does nature repel water? So for instance, go outside, look at any leaf and the veins in a leaf, and what you're seeing is the world's best water distribution network. There's an amazing thing called the Murray's Law that says that all branching structures in the natural world, including our lungs, they all follow a single mathematical formula. And it has to do with the pipe branches, and it drops down to a smaller diameter, and then it branches again, and that drops down to a smaller diameter, and that's predictable. People in building, in green building now, are starting to say, well, maybe our 90 degree angles that we have in plumbing are really friction devices. Maybe we should distribute electricity differently in a building, water differently in a building, even, even gases, even air conditioning differently in a building by mimicking this Murray's Law in, in, our, in our plumbing. The most important thing that people should know is that a sustainable world already exists. We're just now beginning to open our eyes and realize that the answers to the questions we've been asking, how do we live here sustainably, are all around us. She's got a 20 minute video on TED Talk that is fantastic. Here are some of the principles of biomimicry. I need to show that to the rest of the group. See, ask this about your operation. Okay, one of the things when I walk on a farm, here's how I want to, if I know that you're flowing and Larry, that the farm is working and, and you're making money, the number one thing, there's many indicators, 
So, Shauna, if I go on an operation, what's some of the indicators that you look at and you feel the department is doing a good job? Um, I look for no bare soil. Excellent, that's good. What else? What else? Help Shauna and I. Come on, guys. What else do you see some of the indicators? Diversity of crops. Diversity, excellent. What else? Yeah. Weed pressures are pretty low, aren't they? Ted, what else do you think and you see? Okay, yeah, excellent covers. They're starting to do diversity. Animals. Animals in the system. So here's what I see when all of it's put together. The farm is running on new sunlight, not ancient sunlight. Ancient sunlight is chemical fertilizer, pesticides, all those took natural gas, oil, Reduce reduction in diesel. All your inputs will go down. All your inputs will go down. Why would that be, Todd? How come your inputs go down if you're flowing with the natural system? It's just, it's doing the work for you. Then I know you're starting to make money. Because you're not buying all the equipment, you're not buying all the diesel, you're not buying all the chemicals, you're not buying all the fertilizer. You're reducing all of your inputs. Look at the first thing of uh, biomimicry. What does it run on? Sunlight? What's number two? Nature only uses the energy it needs. Number four, uh, nature fits form to function. Now where's Brian at? Is he here? Yeah, right here. Hey, now, Brian, this is going to be hard for a geneticist. Nature fits form to function. What does that mean? We now, in the soul health movement, are pushing for smaller animals. We're pushing for animals that do well on fescue, that will finish well on fescue without grain. And guess what happens with those animals? Are they bigger or are they smaller? Generally speaking, they're smaller. I want an animal that has short legs and a big burly belly that fits well and does well on the low inputs. Form, fits, function. We have behemoths now that are 15, 1600 pounds, right, Ryan, in some cases? We created behemoths that take huge amounts of rain, and then when you put them in the pasture, they fall apart. They can't finish, they can't, you can't, you know where people are heading now? The future is heading with grass-fed beef is growing 25 to 35% per year. People want no hormones, they want no antibiotics, they don't want, they want it to be grass-fed, but they want it to marble beautifully. We have those. They grow amazing animals, and their steaks are amazing. But you have to be really good and have the genetics, and you have to adapt to it. Like Brian, you've got to be really good at what you're doing. It takes a very skilled person to get a grass-fed beef to finish, especially in our area, which is fescue. Nature recycles everything, nature rewards cooperation, nature banks on diversity, nature demands local expertise. What does that mean? Anybody know what that means? If you get this right, Brian will buy you lunch. <laughs> nature demands local expertise. If you ever walk to your ditch bank and you see the grass that's always green, always doing well, that's local expertise. Observe and watch what prospers and does well in the natural system. Start being observers of what's going on in the natural system and what does really well. Nature curbs excess from within. Nature taps the power of limits. Now, let's see how we're doing biodiversity, doing this. Uh, we're going to walk out there and I'm going to show you the skin. We're going to walk out there in my group. I'm going to show you the how important this skin is. We'll talk about that later. Let me show you how we're designing our mixes. Our mixes look like this. We have hundreds of thousands, pushing millions of acres now of
health practices that look like this. Why do I want it? I am bringing ecological memory. Mark, why am I, why do I want my mixes to look like that? Like the prairie, isn't it? I look at the architecture. Every plant capturing energy differently. Look at the architecture, pollinators. I want, I am mimicking the prairie and the forest. That's why my mixes look like that. And the more they look like that, the more beneficials I get. There is a recent research paper that was very fascinating that, that actually states the reason we're not getting the yields that we don't get, that we're not reaching our yield potential, is because we lack pollinators. So what do we do to our pollinators? Do you know that a puppet, they've done studies with Dr. Jonathan London, who's an entomologist. In the beehive box, they found 20 to 30 pesticides. And see, it doesn't matter if you're organic, because if your neighbors are spraying, they get the drift. The farmer that works so hard not to get chemicals on his operation, it is floating, and no matter what you do, if you do buffers or anything, these chemicals are still getting in. And the bees are picking it up from 5 to 10 miles away. And it's in the pollen. This is what we're doing nationally. This is Tennessee. We are planting corn and soybean right into that. That is amazing. He's capturing the sun. He's got diversity. He's got living roots. He's going to make the skin. The only thing that we've got to be fair is having animals in the system. And you don't have to have animals if you don't want them. Then as that corn planter knocks that down, they'll come with a spray and they'll turn it brown and create that skin. We are using this. What is this, class? That is a, not only a sprayer, but a cover crop seeder on standing corn. Farmers are building this. They're doing it. Why? For this reason. They are dropping cover crop seed in the tall boy. Because I've heard some of you say, God, not done. They want this. So I harvest my corn, my cover crop mixes up. So that I'm capturing the sun going into winter, and in the spring I'm capturing sun. Leaking carbon, building aggregates, holding nitrogen, holding nutrients. And they release it. Now, look at my role. This is my daughter's Jetta. I roll my cereal right now. <laughs> Pretty sleepy cool. My daughter was not happy. I said, daughter, let me use your diesel so I can offset your carbon footprint. <laughs> <laughs> Look at my Rhodesian Ridgebacks. I'm going to have animals in the system. I killed that cover crop with no herbicide. I rolled it with the tires. I hit the cereal ride just at the right stage. The wind will knock you down. There. I have this on YouTube. People get a kick out of that. Yeah. Now, this is my daughter, my very unhappy wife. She's my down pressure. I am planting sweet corn into my mix. You know how I rolled that cover down? I did not turn the blade on. I just lowered the deck. I just lowered the deck and planted it right into it. That's you can do this on small farms. That's an old Ellis Chambers uh, no-till corn plant. It was a single row, took it out. They, they did a little bit Dave Brandt built that one. Look at the rollers. We're gonna see a roller in a little while. Look at this lady. She's using a two by four with a rope, knocking it for a cover crop for a garden. Look at the soil temperature differences. I will tell you, I see standing covers and I do rolling covers. You know which is my favorite type? I love the roller. 
The wheat suppression is amazing. Look at the cotton. Do you know where we're able to save farms in Arkansas? There were farms in Arkansas that were no longer being farmed because they could not kill the weeds. Pigweed was invading parts of the farms. No, there was no herbicide. Roundup, they were becoming resistant to all herbicides. You know how we were able to save the South? Cereal rye. Yes, Larry? You're saying you're using rye, and you're saying use the reverse mix. I, I prefer mix. I like mixing with hairy vetch. But hairy vetch, you can't roll that thing. Oh yeah, you can. It'll kill it? Oh, well, you might, if you're gonna go organic, I've been able to, you know that mix I had? It had a little bit of hairy vetch, and it terminated it. But I can't guarantee we'll do it all the time. So, uh, if you're an organic, no, okay, so you can terminate it with a herbicide, do no problem at all. So you can put a four or five weeks now. If you're organic, maybe you might want to just stick with cereal rye, and and because you might. But if it, if it gets out of hand, if I get about, if I only put three pounds of hairy vetch and it gets a little escape from me, you're okay. It's a, it's a legume and it feeds the corn, and you'll be fine. So I don't worry about hairy vetch. What's the trick to killing the hairy vetch? How do you kill it? What do you have to wait for? Uh, oh, for the hairy vetch. Here's my what I look for, Travis. I don't worry about the hairy vetch. I look at the cereal rye. The reason why is I want to hit the cereal rye at the right time for the dough stage because then I know it's time to roll. Then I'll come back and spray. I don't worry about that. You can use 2,4-D, mix it with Roundup or whatever you want to do. I don't worry about hairy vetch. Legumes will do what the legumes will do. I worry about the main crop is the cereal rye. What about on the organic side? If you're going to try and hairy vetch, because you can't do, I mean, I haven't seen corn done successfully with the cereal rye just because they're too nice. It's too what? They're not be successful because they're two nitrogen loving crops. The rye took a lot of the nitrogen away. But hairy vetch is a legume, you know, I, it'd be here's, nice to know if that would work, but then the problem always comes to how do you terminate it? Yeah, here's what you, because you're right. If Travis hits something real important, he says, okay, I, I have a problem with cereal rye because it sucks so much nitrogen. They do, but it will release it back to you. But the corn is a, it's a nitrogen pig, so what do I do? Most of our producers will put liquid nitrogen right off to offset that, that nitrogen because uh, it will suck up the nitrogen. So you could probably use fish oils and you can use some other nitrogen based and then you can put it right by the, by the corn and it solves that issue. Uh, most of our convention will use a little bit of, uh, they'll use a little bit of urine or liquid nitrogen, not an issue. That takes care of it. So I put about 40 or 60 units up front and you'll take care of that nitrogen tie up and it'll release all that nitrogen later back to you. So that's how I fix that. So if you're gonna use cereal rye, use a little bit of nitrogen up front, and so corn is a huge nitrogen pit. Good question. We do it on tobacco, this is the corn. Look how much we cut into it. This is Tony in Watertown. He is planting green. This is him planting green here in Wisconsin. He's been doing this for five years. And he, he's a, he, he didn't want to show his, his stuff because he, the neighbors were really hard on him. And look at his corn pop right out. Look at his soybean. Is that herbicide then after planting? Yeah, he's herbicides right after he plants. But look at this, Mark, it's very really interesting. This is how it looks right afterwards. Look at the corn pop right out of that resin. Now, he's had some heavy rains, he has no crust in him, but look at the guys that do his neighbor. This is his neighbor still. Water him. Tillage. This is the neighbor's soybean field this year. This is his. That's dead cereal rye. And that cereal rye will disappear. <coughs> and if you were to plant early before that, Cover crop is done. You can't say in April. Yeah. There's not a lot of cover crop emergence in April. So plant in it. And could you come back later after it had gotten some hype and then kill it? Well, it it's interesting. I think it's Wisconsin is doing a little bit of research, like for soybean. We, you and I were talking about. If they're coming back and soybeans about this tall, they come back and roll it, and it doesn't hurt the soybean. You can do that with soybean. I don't know if you can do that with corn. I'm saying we plant or spray post emergence and let the cover crop develop without hurting the corn emission. 
uh, I'm, I'm not, I think you could do that. It depends on what, uh, what herbicide you're using. But you're, there's two grass herbicides there, so I don't know if you can pull that off. It's good to consider rising grass and so is it. So all so I'm trying to do is get more growth on the cover. Gotcha. But here's what I would do. Here's what I would do. I would cut down my base varieties. I would put a 90 day corn or even shorter, 85 day corn. But see what happens with producers when you say 85, 90 day corn, what's the first thing that comes into the mind, Todd? I'm gonna lose yield. Right? I have guys doing 90 day corn in Connecticut, 250 bushel corn. You have to look for your varieties. But I still want to plant my corn early so I got more room in the back end behind the corn to okay. establish. Here's the thing. I will not plant corn if the soil temperature is not 58 to 60 degrees. You should be planting corn at 58 unless it's 58 to 60. Why? Corn is a warm season grass. It needs to make association with bacteria and fungi. And if it's cold, now you set your corn up for disease and pathogens. If you go too early, you set yourselves up for disease and pathogens. Why would you want to do that? You've got to wait for that soil to warm up. And then people, this is the argument against no-till. No-till gets colder soil. That's not necessarily true. As the microbial mass builds up, they'll warm up. But please understand, no-till will hold more water. They have more organic matter. But I need the organic matter at the back end. Do you know where our yields collapse? On the back end. The cells don't have any structure, they don't have any glues, they don't have any strength, so they collapse at the back end. The, they can become droughty, there's no organic matter, they can't hold the nutrients, they collapse. One more question. Go ahead, Mike. If you cut and sever the fungi. Yes. Yes. Yeah. How long until it grows back? They'll, they'll, they'll build that, they'll have to build the complete network again. And that takes several days. But it takes energy to go back and do that again. It takes energy, it's taking energy from the plant. Because the, the, the plant is giving you, all, they're giving all that carbon to the fungi, and the fungi is the ones that bring the zinc and the phosphorus and the organic matter to you. So when you sever it, it's messing it up. It messes the system up. And so, last slide. What time is it? Ready for the hours over? Uh, this is the soils from that Tennessee soil that they're like. This is what we started in Tennessee. This is what they turned around. Larry, this is what they've done in three years. Larry, this is what they've done in three years. You asked? Three years of covers this tall. The soils went from this to this. They, they respire 279% more. That means they work more. They consume water, water cycle carbon. Their soil health score started at 11, now they're at 24, 30. Their soils are amazing. Yes, Kevin? Are they growing a commodity crop every year, or is one year just devoted to cover? No, they grow a commodity crop every year. So, corn, mix. Soybean, mix. They never, five, six, seven, eight way mix. So you know what you've technically done? You put eight rotations within a small span of time and you're leaking different molecules and carbon and feeding biology. Ground's always covered, so you, you can grow corn every year if you want. Corn, corn, go corn, mix, corn, mix, corn, mix. Not an issue. Because now, guess what you've done? You're about diversity within a small window of frame of time. Changes everything. Yes, sir, Travis, and we'll call it quits. I think this picture to me answers some of the questions I had watching this simulator here because uh, I'm an organic farmer, so I obviously use conventional tillage sure. in my rotation. Um, I have experience working with other farmers, and one thing that I've seen is there's a number of farms that have no till, and you know, take a dairy operation that's no till. And he's got a rotation of hay, and he's got a rotation of corn, maybe a year, and he goes back to hay. But we're running huge, heavy equipment. We're taking four or five crops of hay, we're running combine for uh, choppers and disc binds and everything yeah. else. That compaction becomes a large issue in that. Absolutely. And so that, you know, that picture there shows no-till without a lot of compaction. <laughs> yeah, this one right here has and a so lot. That, Actually, if you look at, Actually, Travis, if you look real closely, it has compaction, right? 
Look at the layers. Look at the stratification. Here's where we fail to notice. For me to say that all no tail doesn't cause as much runoff, <laughs> you know, I've been on farms where we take soil prods and try and put, put it in, and there's more compaction on the no tail side than there is maybe where they did some conventional tillers at. I think there's a difference between over no tailing and over conventional tilling. Here's, here's I'm what, against recreation. <laughs> here's what's going on, Travis. The no-till by itself was was only part of the story. Yeah. See, no-till stops the destruction of the house, but it wasn't building the factory. When you go to covers, the dynamic changes. Okay, and so that we weren't building enough cottage cheese, so a lot of the no-till you see is really poor no-till. There's no diversity, and they take way too much carbon and do not build enough aggregates. Look at the aggregation on that soil right there. Beautiful. Yeah, so. This one is where we need to be. Now, is all organic doing a bad job? No. I've seen some really good organic farmers, but here's my here's the brutality. If you're tilling every year, it's too much stress. You should be tilling every one or three or four years. But you can do that with the rotations of bringing animals into the system. Right now, our, our organic farmers till way too much. They till every year too much. That's too much stress in the system. You cannot really build it. You have problems with weeds. You have major issues. I've been on a lot of organic farmers. The, the, the soil are trashed. And their scores are horrible. And but, but the reality, we have weakness in all systems. And you're right, Travis. I see some really crappy no-till. And a lot of it's just plain crappy no-till because the rotations are poor and no covers. So you're right. Last time you gave some good example, good uh, things for uh, people taking off a lot of hay. Probably worth mentioning again today. Oh, okay. Kevin is saying that uh, taking, uh, how do you take things out of hay? So you uh, gave four or five things to do with needed a lot of hay in rotation. Oh, good, 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 yes. Yesterday I talked about, I'll make this quick and we'll eat. Uh, how many of you hay? Raise your hand. Okay, hay is one of the hardest things in the soil, too. So, Travis, tell us why hay is so brutal. Well, hay what do you think? Oh, crap out of it, mining all the nutrients out of it. <laughs> and you're hoping you get something next year. <laughs> Absolutely, so what you do is you take the hay and you extract all the carbon residue from the top. Now remember, 35% of our building glues comes from the residue on top. Now, guess what else you do? You haul all the phosphorus, the calcium, and the nutrients, and then guess what else you do? You diminish the aggregates because you take too much. The cottage cheese, you just burn it bad. When we do the simulator, like to the big one out there, we do hay field right next to it. There is more runoff or just as much runoff on the hay field. Even if it has cover, it will run off completely just like the till field. You diminish the cottage cheese. Yes, that's it. How do you deal with your manure out Yeah. So the question is, how do you deal with the manure? Leave it on the surface for it. Do not disc it in. Here's what you do when you disc it in. Remember I told you to wake up those teenager bacteria? Now you throw a five gallon gas can. So it's like lighting a match in your house, and then you throw a five gallon can, and you give it all the manure and nitrogen, and it start to, the microbes eating more aggregates. So it's like throwing up, it's like an old rancher told me, he said, Ray, why are you gonna stop killing this team? And why? When I disc, I release nitrogen. I said, yeah, you're right. You burn the house down to warm up the hot dog. How stupid was that? So when you go through a manure on top and you just it, you just made it worse. Now you set the fuel and then you move seeds and weeds and you make it worse. You know, like, like, like you said, you know, we're about different, you know, like, because you know, you see people like this manure in and stuff like that, you know, it's one of the best in the world. You know, there's a different nutrients in there and everything. Well, you get more credits because, see, look, we all worry about what, what do we, why do we do this? We're worried about nitrogen, aren't we? Well, how ridiculous is that? How do these ecosystems function? Did the buffalo have a disc in their butt? Oh, I'm losing nitrogen. I better disc it in. That's what they tell us in college. I don't worry about nitrogen. I showed you this. This is your nitrogen packet. I'm shut up. I promise I'll shut up after this. But here's your nitrogen, guys. Here is your nitrogen. You want to know where your nitrogen is coming from? Right here. 
This, this is why I don't worry about nitrogen anymore. It's called this. Bacteria. They're made out of protein. They convert into nitrogen. They multiply every 20 minutes. In one tablespoon, there's 7 billion of them. And the moment you do this, living root, slow motion, the more root you put in, the more of this. 90% of nutrient cycling is biological. The manures, the urines, the cover crops, and now we know bacteria that actually fix nitrogen on their own. You get this way. Get that way. Leak liquid sun and it feeds this. I don't worry about nitrogen. That manure, the fungi, the bacteria, and the dumb goodos, they'll take it down. They don't need me. You just screw things up. Let them do that because at the end of the day, guys, you know what you're trying to protect? It's right here. Okay, one more slide and we're done. Ben told you to worry about the Yeah, Ben. Did I tell you to do it? Yeah. I think I just told you to do more damage, right? Yeah, look at this. Okay, last one. The weight. On the left side, this is bioturbation. If you look on the left side, just fungus, fungus and bacteria. Look at this side. All the living critters. This is the nutrient cycle. They're doing this. They, do, they break all the carbon. They do this. They build the glue. They break that down. If you run a disc and a plow, what can you do to this? You diminish it. Then you have to haul compost. You have to haul, uh, you have to haul manures in. You have to put fertilizer because you screwed this up. So the less you disturb that, that's why I love no-till. With covers. Yep. And that's why I love organic guys that are trying to go to organic no-till and they only till once every three years. Then, you know how you make it work? Livestock. You cannot make it work without the livestock. Because it gives you those long periods so you don't have to disturb that. That's what we're trying to accomplish guys. Cut down that tillage so you don't mess that up. And then I don't have to buy fertilizers. I don't have to worry about my... Because see, guys, please understand, these organisms that we screw up are this ones right here because they mess up the beneficials. Did you guys know that a majority of the beneficials complete their life cycle in the soil? All of these guys, we need them all. On the top, on the surface, all these have their life cycles in the soil. So if you disc them and till them, there are 1,700 beneficials for every pest. So if you're tilling bare ground, you're messing up your, your whole beneficial insect populations. Connected? Let's get a big round of applause. adaptive management and we're going to change things up a little bit. You know how we had, and my biggest apologies would just be to our uh, guests with the soil pit and the rainfall simulator. We're cutting the three sessions down to two, which is cool. Um, you'll have to choose unless our people want to stay later and just stay later. go Let's later. Go. I'm not going anywhere. I'll be here all day. Don't cut the rain simulator. No, the rainfall simulator will be okay. happening, but their soil pits are fantastic oh, too, too, too. with really powerful contrast between cornfields and... You guys are already here. You drove four hours. You're all ready. ready. Yeah. But there are no mistakes, Greg. We're learning every day. Uh, I think it's pretty neat that we've got the diversity in our group. Again, a group of producers that have gotten together, pulled together by... Ben and Matt, um, and I appreciate both of those guys and the fact that uh, they likewise aren't coming
to us and mandating anything. They say, you know, they pretty much keep us between the white lines. Uh, we're just getting started. We don't know what this thing's going to look like, right? Producers, we have no idea. Yes, Jillian. Did everybody hear? The, the question was, what is the history that brought this group together? And I'm going to tell you, unless somebody else wants to share as well, it truly, the, 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 the catalyst were these two guys, okay? They said, hey, let's look at this map. Let's look at the rain events we've had the last few years. And what do you think, farmers? Does anybody else remember it another way? Beer plus pizza. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I just, I, I really, I, I do believe, truly, Jelly and the Catalyst were these two men and their staff. And uh, then the rest of the farmers all stood back as we watched some of the rain events that we've seen here in the last five to ten years. Um, and we said, hey, maybe, maybe, just maybe, there's some things that we might need to explore to mitigate some of the runoff. And we don't, again, we don't know what this is going to end up looking like. We're going to try some different things. We all know, I mean, I have, we as producers have the same questions that everybody's asking here. How are we going to do this? I don't know. And we're going to make mistakes. But we know there are, there are probably better ways to do it. Okay. Just briefly about our operation, we came here 35 years ago. The Borgen family owned this property, still own it today, and, and they've been here since the early 1900s. It'd be Dan Borgen's <coughs> mother who was born across the road. Okay, I've got two great guys helping me. Okay, we're working together as a team: Ryan Liddell and Joe Monson. Okay. And we run 270 registered Angus cows, we calve them, and we sell 150 bulls a year. And I will tell all of you, our focus for the last 35 years have been on the cattle, okay? Form follows function. We use the data to create cattle that are profitable. And oh, by the way, we've learned that if we take better care of the land, and do a better job grazing, and we're still learning. I talked to Larry Smith, wherever Larry's at. We're still learning that whole process. We're not doing everything right, but it, is been, it has been compelling to see the increased grazing opportunities. Right now, we, we've got a pair on 1.3 acres, okay? That's all the open grass that we have. We run a pair for 1.3 acres. We outwinter the cattle. We still make mistakes. This soil pit you're going to see this afternoon is continuous corn for the last 25 because that's where all the cows hang out for the 30 days prior to calving. I'm still trying to figure out what to do with the mud in the month of March when the frost is not quite out. Okay. We make mistakes there. We, we spread our hay out on the grass pastures in the winter time, and it's building soils. You're gonna see a soil pit up the road where literally the organic matter in that, we, we ran a soil test is 6%, okay? So when you said how many um, gallons for each percent? 17 to 25,000 gallons for every 1%. Yeah. So, so those are the things um, I'm, I'm in, I'm, I am energized by the fact, again, I mentioned Ryan and Joe. Here's two young men that graduated from River Falls, okay? And they're going to help me think outside of my traditional approach, okay? A lot of things we do around here, we do because it's convenient, because it's been working, okay? We really don't have a reason to make a lot of changes. The cows are getting bred. We've got enough feed, everything's working well, but it has caused us to pause here recently. We've, we've experimented with some covers and some grazing mixes, and we're just getting started. So, that's my story. Again, I appreciate 
it, it, the, the invigorating part of it so far has been the reality that all of us are trying to figure out how we're going to keep this thing working as we go forward. I actually, Lori and I both grew up in Iowa, and when we cross the river at Lansing and drive to Omaha, wow. Okay? We have proven in the breadbasket that we can grow corn and soybeans. <laughs> but I don't know at what price. Okay? And that's kind of what we're starting. This is just the infancy of exploring some alternatives. It's, I've had producers call me and say, what are you guys doing? Are you going to organic grass-fed beef? No, not necessarily. We don't know. But we do have this area with water and climate, the cool nights, the grasses, the, the hills limit disease vectors. There are some real value propositions to Southwest Wisconsin. And Ray, you've been all over. So with that, that's all I have. We're going to go around and look at these soil pits, hopefully ask questions, hopefully learn some things. And I'll turn it back over to them. Okay, thanks everybody for being here. Uh, my name is Ted Bay, uh, formerly recently of Extension, now I work for the Wallace Center in promoting cover crops. Um, Mark is my partner in our work on cover crops, Mark Wang, and some of you may know him, he's a crop consultant. And he and I spent yesterday working on these samples, and so how many have seen this before? Some of you I know have seen this before. Anyway, if you want to learn, I learned something last year. If you want to learn something about your soils, you want to be out there kneeling in your field when it's raining really hard. Now, I'm not Pretty saying that I, it stops raining or what? <laughs> I'm not saying I actually did that, but I was on a field last year, just before it rained, watch it just pour down, and I was out there with right after it rained, and here there was this individual rye seed with a column of soil underneath it. The rain had washed everything away from it. This single seed was acting as a tiny piece of residue and everything else was gone all around it. It was sitting on a column of soil. And so when it's raining really hard, you've heard what Ray said today, and based on what he said, if it's raining really hard, you ought to know in the back of your mind what the heck has happened in my field if it looks like one of these right here. And that's this thing, instead of standing in the rain on our hands and knees, we get to stand here in the sun and watch it do its thing. Mark, you want to tell us what we got here for samples? Sure. If you start over here on the uh, on your left side, this is a piece of pasture sod just from about 50 feet away from the uh, soil pit over there in, uh, in the pasture here. The uh, hay field is about second or third year uh, mixed alfalfa, clover, grass, uh, hay field from a long-term organic farm. Yep. The piece in the middle is actually from the cornfield right out behind here right, right next to the pit four feet away from the soil pit over there so you can see exactly what's going on here this corn has been vertical tilled and that's what was described earlier this morning as being 20 years continuous corn yep and compaction with cattle cattle in the spring right yeah, that's right, too. right. So, okay uh the next one over there that is uh vertical tilled uh, soybean rotation. It's in soybeans this year. The grower uh, uses a real disc to do some vertical tillage in the fall, hits it, hit it again in the spring, and then planted, no till planted it, to, or without any further tillage, planted it to soybeans. That farm has been in the corn soybean rotation for over 20 years. Uh, the last field on the left was uh, organic. You can see very obviously crimped down rye. There's a lot of rye residue underneath there. Using this very crimper right here. Okay. <laughs> and I don't know the tillage history on that. I Which one? Remember Ted, on the soybeans. One on the end there. Oh, Here's. I don't. I know it's had some tillage, but I don't know the record exactly. It was corn the prior year. Brian, just to cover our rear ends just a little bit, what happened on this field last year? Oh, on the, we did, because of my 
bright young minds, they convinced we were long on feed. So we put uh, oats and peas on this field in end of April. We put it in a bag the 1st of July. We seeded a uh, grazing mix with tiller radishes and, and turnips, and we grazed it twice. Okay. So we shifted one year, but we, it was only because we had enough feed, we didn't need the corn, let's try this as an experiment. I only brought that up because of the impact on compaction that you might have benefited from there, from that mix you right think, there. Well, we'll see, because when you look in the soil pit, it's pretty hard stuff. And what was the condition of the cover going into winter? The condition of the cover going into winter was it had been grazed off. <laughs> now, Ray spoke a lot about soil health parameters. There's kind of four basic ones. And they're so simple that it irritates me when I have to look at a list to remember them. <laughs> but Ray, maybe you want to say something about what we see here for soil health care, you know, practices and not that sort of thing? Absolutely. I want you guys to get a little close. I want to show you something. I, I, I think it's really critical. We talked about, actually there's five principles we talked about. Reduce disturbance, chemical, physical, and biological, remember? We want to have a skin, an armor. Now I want you to notice something. What do you observe right up when it comes to the skin? I call it the armor. What do you notice on all the, the, uh, the, the management uh, practices here? Thank you, the management practices and the, and the, and the cookie cutter things. But before we, you answer, let me, let me make this very clear. What Mark and, and Ted did, it, it took a lot of work to do this. I don't think you guys realize how amazing it takes a lot of work to do. <laughs> We're get hiring it out next it. time. And we, and, we, yeah, and, we, and we really, and we really appreciate said, that. So Ted said this is the last time he's ever going to do this. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's not easy to do this, but it's so well worth it. Because you can save these, uh, these, um, uh, these cookie cutter things, I call them, what do they call them, these pans. A dye pan, yeah. Thank, thank you. Now, what do you guys observe right off the top, Tess? What do you see right here that's noticeable? I want you to look at the surface. Two of them are naked. They're naked. Good, Kevin. What else? Cracking. Crust. Look at the crust. Mark, I was telling Mark, I said, now look at the crust. Now I want you to observe something here. If you look at the natural ecosystems, they always have a skin. If you notice when you see those, those uh, spruce trees, some of those spruce needles start turning brown, they fall, and they create that skin called detritus sphere. So ecologists call it the detritus sphere. And so if you look right here, look at this, as you have the green grass, guess what? You also have the brown. You'll see that in the pasture, you'll see that in the prairie. What you'll do is those, that dyeing and browning actually starts creating that natural skin. Where you have that skin, there's no crust. There's no crust. So when I'll go later explaining, when I go with the shovel, I'm going to talk to you more in depth what I look for. And then here, also, guess what we're starting to see again? Oh, wow. It starts that natural process. Every plant does that. Why would it do that? Why would it start doing that? You start having these leaves die. Because we say, well, some people say it's a lack of nitrogen. Some of the, it's a natural process. Why would plants do that? They, can't, they don't have feet. They can't walk away from their environment. They're actually modifying it. So how are they modifying their soil environment? By doing that. What is that doing? Now watch, before you guys answer, notice what we, this is why I love the roller. This is biomimicry to the max. When I pull that residue, over here, that skin, guess what? No crust. So why is crust so brutal, Nathan? Make it uh, hard for water to come Not only that, the oxygen CO2 interface is, is, is minimalized. We want that interface. And when you have a carbon skin, that skin is so critical. And you watch, these two, these three systems, they're, they're creating their own skin. So this is why, but what else do we get from the benefit of having that skin? Todd, what do you think? What's the other benefit of having that skin there? Temperature regulation. Temperature regulation, very good. What else? It's like a mulch, so it's about moisture. It, it holds moisture in, suppresses weeds. 
Accepts, excellent mark. Intercepts the raindrops, feeds the microbes. 30-35% of this right here. And this is the nature of properties of soils. 30-35% of that goes to making humic and non-humic super molecules that feed the soil. Makes organic matter. 30-35%. So what happens to the other 60-some percent? It's digested. Where does it go, Travis? Digested carbon. It, it goes off in the atmosphere of CO2. And 8% goes to the mafia. <laughs> you got to feed the organisms that are doing that. So we need that skin. And we're going to show you when these guys do, when they turn this on, you're going to see the impact of not having that skin on that surface. Now, what you're going to watch is I want you to see what's going to happen. That's why I had them put up the white board. Let's see what happens when they turn that water on. Hey, Ray, before you do that, can you comment on how fire may impact that skin? Oh, good question. My biologists really go crazy when I tell them that. Here's the thing. Fire is a tool, just like tillage, all these things we are, they're tools. But you can cut your finger, chainsaw's a tool, you can cut your foot off with it. If the fire is too hot, you can actually cause <coughs> the top of the surface, you not only go off, with a, you release a lot of organic matter on the surface, but you can actually get the soil surface to get so hot, you actually create a sealing, you actually seal the soil surface. And you actually turn the sand and the sands and the silts, you almost make glass. So you, you actually create a crust if it's too hot. So I tell people when you do your fires, make sure they're cool fires. You can create too much fuel, get it too hot, and create a massive problem. Not only did you release carbon into the atmosphere, but you created, uh, there's a word, what's it called, an amorphous substance. Glass is an amorphous substance. You turn a solid in the heat and you almost caught it to create a seal on the top of the surface. You have to be careful with fire. So the research shows that it's, it could be brutal if it's too hot. Are you referring to a flame weeder or something else? It's like more of like you're gonna burn a prairie or something. Yeah, like that. yeah, and so when you do control burning, uh, you gotta be careful not to store up too much fuel in the system because it get too hot. Well, you don't wanna burn when it's, the relative humidity is really low anyway. And that's when you get those hot fires when you're doing a control burn. That, you want the RH a little higher. That's a good point. And then if you have a little bit of moisture in the soil, you can abate some of that heat. Because remember, a majority of the biology is up at one or two, three inches of the soil, guys. And I have had farmers say, but Ray, I'm only touching the upper inch. The biology is on the top one inch. <laughs> a majority of the biology in the top one or two uh, inches, guys. So you gotta be careful with that top surface and manage it. That's why we have a lot of people pulling tile drains all over the all over the Midwest. I said, look, you can put all the tile drain you want, but if I don't take care of that first inch and you don't have aggregation, you don't get water to flow into the top of the tile drain. And yet, that's why I get frustrated with NRCS and us supporting tile drains if you don't do it in a system. Where's the cover crops? Where's the no-till or the limited disturbance? with the tile drain. What we do is single practice it, then we're gonna get in trouble with water quality issues. We are getting in trouble with water quality issues. Because now you have a tile drain and you have no covers, you have a leaky system, now you have a point source. That's why Iowa got in such big trouble. These soils do not stop mineralizing. There is, these soils do not go to absolute death, even in dead of winter with snow. They're still functioning. They, these soils can go away. They're still organisms functioning at low temperatures. So I, I, you just have to be careful. Yes, Larry? Why would I ever want to burn? Why would you ever want to burn from a crop system? Never. Okay. But he's talking about when he's doing with natural systems and, and when you've got CRP land or you've got some of that stuff, when you've got not a wooded vegetation, that's why I get frustrated with CRP, Conservation Reserve Program. What happens when you don't allow animals to graze, now you start getting oxidized material on the top, you get no nutrient cycling, the system's not functioning. Soils need grazing. These grass systems need cows and urine. That's why I get frustrated with the political aspect is they're, they're making cows the plague of the planet. They are not the plague of the planet. So we gotta make it clear, the grass, the cow needs, the grass needs the cow, and the cow needs the grass.
and the soil needs both of them. Yes, sir. Um, has there been any research or you know, um, like the uh, amount of uh, microbial activity in soil like that that gets heated up a lot during the day versus yes, that good. cover and the fact that there's actually food for them to eat on it? Good question, yes, uh, Nathan. They, if you go over a temperature of 113, <laughs> soil temperature over 113, you start shutting soil enzymes. And soil enzymes are critical for nutrient cycling. So if the soil temperature gets over 113 degrees, you start shutting soil enzymes. Mm. I don't want that. Now, 140, you're starting to actually, actually cook the bacteria. But 113, you start nu nutrient cycling down. 113 degrees. That's in the, a lot of the soil ecology testing, so, some of the soil ecology literature. You have to be a really nerd to pick up all this detail. But it's it's been um, documented. Okay, you guys ready? DJ Mark or? Yeah, yeah. You ready? Yeah, we are ready. They <coughs> just, you know, we don't want to stand on this green hole. Kind of get wet. things to a halt. <laughs> and we hope we're still lined up well, so we'll, we'll see how it goes. You guys want to back up just a little bit. We'll get wet. We'll start raining. <laughs> Now, I told you how fast does the rain come down? 15 to 20 miles an hour. That kinetic energy as it hits that soil. Now, I want you to observe as that droplet is coming down, and there's a reason I asked Mark and Ted to um, put that. I want you to notice on the back here. What are you starting to see right off the top of the bat? What do you see on that white board? Splatter. Splatter. You see detachment. So why is that a problem if you're growing soybean or any kind of tomatoes or plants? That is a vector for pathogens. Because now when you have that detachment, you land that that soil lands on the plant, now it becomes a vector for disease and pathogens. Also, too, a lot of our diseases and parasites that we're picking up is a lot of times because we overgraze and the animals are exposed to much dirt, too much soil. And they inhale it and they pick up parasites and they pick up black leg and they pick up some of these diseases because they have too much soil exposed and we're grazing in too short. So we create a lot of these problems because we take too much from the system. Path, uh, parasites, pathogens, disease, a lot of it's led a lot of times because we just take too much from the system. Does anybody have any kind of prediction what's going to happen? <laughs> Does anybody want to bet? Nobody? Pretty evident. I, I think it's going to be quite evident what's going to happen. Well, we'll let the soil speak. This is why we love doing this demonstration. It's worth for it is worth doing all the work for this because if it changes one heart and mind to actually do the covers, it was worth it to me. I've done these, and there's a lot of work. But the beauty about this is once you store them and let them dry, you can use them about for about two or three months, and it does the same thing every time. Ted's gonna take them home with him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I heard naysayers. Suggests that you get a lot of like insects, cutworms, and things like that under that mat. Now, okay. what did I say? 1,700 beneficials for every one pest. If you don't know anything about ecology, that's the exact statement that somebody would make. Guess what? Why are we not overrun with insects? Have we ever pondered that? They multiply every hour. Why are we overrun with insects? Predators. Self-healing, self-organizing, self-regulating. The problem that most of the time we have with disease and insects, why? Why do we have some problems with cutworms? One, what is the purpose of an insect? Uh, they reproduce, but why are insects always taking over the, don't they attack the weak plants? Or they yeah. see a weakness? Mm -hmm. They can see, different spectrums 
of light that we can, and they can sense these things. They, can't, they pick on plants that have way too much nitrogen, it's because the soil is out of balance. There's different species of nitrogen that is wrong in the plant that makes it more susceptible to disease and pathogens. It's running on it. It's not going in that one there. The far one. This one right here is not going in? The back one. So what I'm saying to you, when we set up our own disease and pathogens, a lot of the times, Mark, that's what's happening. Now, am I saying that we don't, that we won't have an outbreak? Absolutely. You're dealing with a natural system. You will have a lot of times. If we have a really, really warm season in the south, you'll have a flight of army worms come in. Please understand. If you interpret the world from your own personal bias and not knowing there might be flights a couple hundred miles away that came because there was a climatic change in the different area. But yet, what are we going to blame? What do farmers always blame right off the top of the bat? You always blame when you did something new. We always blame the cover crops. That's the first thing they always get to blame, Mark. I know. I get the phone calls from all over the country. Right. The cover crops. I'm having a problem with slugs. I have a problem with army worms. <clears throat> Do those things occur? Yes. But they may have a little tiny outbreak. But you know what's causing problems with slugs for us now? It's these neonics that coat the, uh, the seed. It's killing some of our beneficials that control the slugs. Those neonics are brutal not only on the fly, on the uh, bees, but they're also brutal on the predatory beetles. And guess what our soybeans are coated with? The neonics. What are the corns coated with? The neonics. So a lot of the times we create our own problems. Okay, I think we got a good... What do you think, Ted? You think good? I think we did good. I think. Mm -hmm. How about we can shut it off? A little over I just got my pants wet on like I just peed on myself. <laughs> I mean. But I, I want you guys to notice. Look at the top of that surface right away. Mm -hmm. I'll let it run down in here. Yeah, because it's got it on the hose, right? I just don't want it to. I'll give it. Yeah.